<laughs> Y'all get Dr. Umar Johnson in rap form tonight. Y'all getting Dr. Umar Johnson in rap form. The culture comes first. Could you imagine if Deion Sanders was at a historically Mexican college? <laughs> And he got an offer to go to Boulder, Colorado and turn his back on the Mexican students at the Mexican college on the Mexican football team. He would have never done. Why is this looked at like turning your back? I just. He took a job. But because he did. He had a chance to make a structural, systemic, historic change in the benefit of. So black you athletes. believe you, you believe that they would have let him make that change, but you don't believe that we have that access to any power, but he could have made that change what single handedly. What access to power at Boulder, Colorado? No, it's not a finished product. This is what I'm okay, saying. What will the finished you continue product look like? But we don't know. But he's on a journey the same a way. Journey See, here's the thing I find. Here's the thing I find disingenuous. You were someone that started a school. You mm -hmm. went through criticism. Uh -huh. Every move you were trying to move. And here, so I'm. Here's another black man. I'm building a black school. He had a white college. How you comparing them? Listen. Hit. I know Deion Sanders had a charter school. He never owned an independent school like I do. It listen, was a charter li listen, school. Li listen. It was a charter school. It was a charter school. Well, hold, hold, do you know the charter school? Hold on, school sweetheart. Is? We'll give y'all a chance. Charter we'll, schools we'll give y'all a chance to speak. Systems. You know, we are live recording. Charter schools are publicly owned. We the are Frederick live recording. Douglas Marcus Garvey Academy is independently owned by black what people. What I'm saying, listen, back back to what charter I'm saying. School. Hey, uh, Umar. LeBron James, uh, Umar. charter school. Dr. Dr. Umar Johnson. Charter school. Listen, though. Who owns it? Listen. Who owns it? Listen. Who owns hey. it? Hey. Hold on, sweetheart. I'm so we'll give you an opportunity. I'm gonna give you a mic in just no a second. That's a charter school. Listen though. Up there their podcast. podcast live show was like it was real cool the host he was asking a lot of like good questions for umar to like he was giving a lot of pushback for umar to give his more you know more what he had to say about the topics he had my experience of the it's up there live podcast show was amazing i came because i met alone next time you have a show i definitely will be in attendance and i was i have my own podcast so i'm definitely learning a lot from this man King is giving me gems every time I see him. Um, I really enjoyed the It's Up There podcast live show. Um, I learned a lot. It's Up There live podcast show was amazing. It was a good time and always informational and uh, the perfect date night for a Friday night. I think the It's Up There live podcast was phenomenal. Definitely a platform that I am so glad to be a part of. It was definitely enlightening and motivating and empowering. Oh, it was Awesome. I am so glad. I had so many other things going on tonight, but I made it an, uh, 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 important. It was very important for me. It was also important for me to bring my grandson to share with everybody I know. Tonight, tonight is a very special, you know, they say, you know, you, you know, closed mouth don't get fed. This guy that's coming to the stage in a few minutes, I've known him since he was about 10. And he's been coming up for the last few years. And I mean, this thing right here is what's happening. And if you've listened, how many of y'all have listened to this podcast? Like y'all know about Big Loon. He is a guy that has come from the mud uh, and has made this thing, putting this city on his back and on the map, and he's about to bring out a cat that I know that you all are ready to see. He is in the back right now, and y'all know Dr. Umar, but right now, I want y'all to please welcome to the stage the guy that's about to take podcasting through the roof, through the stratosphere, and give Nashville something to truly love. Once again, put your hands together for my man on the It's up there podcast my man big Lou. Yeah. 
What's up, my brother? Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank everybody for being here today. I go by Big Loon. It's up there podcast. For those of you that don't know me, anybody that you can think of um, in the culture. So I thank y'all for coming out. This is a live taping. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is have a very, very important conversation with Dr. Umar Johnson. Any of y'all know Dr. Umar? All right. Cool, cool, cool. Without further ado, man, let's bring out Dr. Umar Johnson. Can we get the, can we get the, uh, I'll just click, okay. All right. Dr. Umar, how are you, sir? I'm well. Glad to be back in Nashville. It's been about four years. This might be my third visit overall. I end up in Memphis a lot more. I'm not sure why, but I have to start spending a little bit more time in Nashville. You, you know, your last time in Nashville, ironically, we did a podcast. Yes, sir. It was at the beginning of this thing that I've created, and you are my first repeat guest. I told you that backstage. This thing is important to me, right? The conversations, uh, the curriculum, the things that we discuss is very important. For me to have a repeat guest for my audience speaks volumes. And I want to let you know that, as I did in the back, you know, in public, that I appreciate what you bring Thank to you, the brother. Game. Appreciate you as well. Today we're gonna have a we're gonna have a heated conversation. All right. There's a lot to talk about. Yes, sir. Um, so for the recording, you guys, I need to start off um, speaking to the camera. So y'all give me a second. Welcome to us up there podcast. I go by Big Loon, your active and attractive host for another episode of the fastest growing podcast on the market right now. Who we have here today is a monumental force in black culture. This guy is someone that if you ain't seen him, you had to be hiding under a rock. We got Dr. Umar Johnson in the building to have a monumental conversation. I don't want to, Doc, I told you back there, I don't want to really have a conversation about your school because everywhere you go, we have the same conversations and I think they put you in this spot where it's just comfortable, comfortable for you to speak and I want us to have a real conversation today. But for the audience, can you give them an update on your school really quick? Uh, absolutely, uh, brothers and sisters. And let me first say thank you to those of you who have supported and donated to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. We get a lot of donations from across the uh, state of Tennessee, a lot of them. Um, and we just completed all the renovations on the school. Uh, so now, yes, yes. So now we have an HVAC inspection that'll take place in a few days, and then we'll be applying for our certificate of occupancy from the city of Wilmington, Delaware. Once that's done, we're gonna have a paint day to paint the school, a cleanup day to clean up, ain't much to clean up, and then a furniture day to move all the school furniture in, and then we're gonna have a grand opening for the community. So I wanna invite all of you to come on up to Wilmington, Delaware, to the grand opening of the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. We're not gonna start school for the young people for another year, because we need time to get all that right, but we're gonna start holding community programs immediately. There will be a conscious singles convention. For those of you who are conscious and looking for a mate, uh, of the opposite gender, who's also woke. Uh, we're gonna have the Conscious Singles Convention. Uh, we're gonna have Black Women's Convention, Black Men's Convention, Ex-Offender Conference, Black Media Conference, Black Investors Conference, Black Farmers Conference. We plan on having two conferences every month for the community. So although FDMG will be a school by day, it will also be a black community organizing hub by night. Uh, we're about 20 minutes from the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania International Airport. PHL, so you want to look and see what flights get you to Philly the quickest round trip from uh, Nashville and you just drop 20 minutes to the front door of the school. Uh, Harriet Tubman spent a lot of time in Wilmington. Frederick Douglass escaped through Wilmington. The Honorable Marcus Garvey incorporated his Black Star Line steamship in Wilmington. Bob Marley used to spend his summers in Wilmington. So a lot of history there in Wilmington, Delaware, right down the street from Philadelphia. Shout out to you, Doc. Um, I know building that school, I know what it's like to, to build some, but some of that magnitude, man, just monumental. I yes, know that sir. fight is a, it's a mean it was, fight. It was, it, was, it was a hard road, my brother. 
Yeah. Nine years, I remember we took our first fundraiser in April of 14, St. Louis. Uh, we wanted to purchase the St. Paul's College in Lawrenceville, Virginia, an HBCU that was closed down. Uh, they wanted $2 million. We didn't have any money. We started raising money for St. Paul's College. The Chinese bought it, uh, took it right from up under us. So then we said, well, let's just get us a day school. So I thought we were going to end up in Detroit because Detroit has a lot of Catholic schools in great shape that were being sold for a reasonable price. Once they found out the purchaser was myself, they refused to sell. Mm. Then there was a school in Mount Vernon, New York, hometown of uh, Denzel Washington, Heavy D, Puffy. And uh, we wanted to lease this Catholic school. They found out it was me. They said no. We had another school right outside of Cleveland, Ohio, Cleveland Heights, Catholic school. Philadelphia, we had a Catholic school. Trenton, New Jersey, we had a Catholic school. My point is we could have been open years ago. But every time we found a school that was worth buying, they, once they found out I was the purchaser, they refused to sell it. And in places like Chicago and Detroit, the public schools for sale, they would only offer me the schools in the worst condition. So the good schools, they wouldn't even show them to me. When I went to Detroit, they showed me schools with no roof, schools with no back, schools with the water up to your thigh. Mm. Why are you showing me this when you got a school right across the street? Mm. So uh, it, it was made very clear to me that the white power structure wasn't going to do anything uh, to help me get this school. So one day, I'm on, uh, what is it, a loop net, and I see this school in uh, Wilmington, former charter school, was a black charter school, and I'm on my way down to the Nat Turner uh, 2017 Great North American Eclipse, if you remember that, that big eclipse. Yes, it yes. was August 21st of 2017. So August the 20th, I stopped by the school, I saw it, went down there and celebrated Nat Turner with the eclipse, came back, Went to Cuba to get my E5 initiation, came back, got into the school. I said, this is where we need to be. But they wanted $2 million. We didn't have it. So they wanted the same price St. Paul's wanted. We didn't have it. So I stayed after them for 18 months. I kept calling, harassing them, pestering them. And I said, listen, nobody going to buy this school but me. Sell me the school. And then one day I called them. And I don't know, it was just my lucky day. They said, we're going to give it to you for what you got. And so wow. February the 7th of 2019, we closed. Wow. Wow. That's dope. Yeah. So um, how do you explain to someone who doesn't know you what you do and why you do it? Uh, I mean, formally, you know, I always start with the formal. So I tell folks, you know, Dr. Umar Ifatunde is a doctor of clinical psychology, certified school psychologist, a pan-Africanist, a former minister of education for Marcus Garvey's UNIA, author of two books, uh, Black Parent Advocate and uh, Psychoacademic Holocaust, founder, obviously, FDMG Academy and the National Independent Black Parent Association. But if I was to sum all that up, I would say that as a Pan-Africanist, we all, as black people, as African people, have to decide how we're going to make our contribution to our people. And so for me, I've decided to do it in the area of education and mental health. And so opening up this first school, we're hoping to have so many more come after it. Because from a psychological perspective, I understand we can't change nothing about our predicament until we change the way we think. And so the thinking has to be changed in the children. Frederick Douglass, one of the models of our school is uh, Frederick Douglass, who I'm related to by blood. He said, quote, it's better to raise strong children than repair broken men. And so that's the motto of FDMG, get them while you're young, because being a therapist, I know most people who come to therapy will never change. They will never get helped. People show up with depression, bipolar, anxiety, low self-esteem, domestic abuse, suicidality. Most of them will never change because they're not ready to. Mm. So that's people who've been dealing with a problem for five or 10 years. You're talking about African people who've been dealing with post-traumatic slavery disease for 400 years. So if people don't change after 10 years, imagine 400. Right. So we have our work cut out for us, but I definitely believe that the mind, we have to start with the mind. There's no economic revolution. There's no political revolution. There's no social revolution. There's no cultural revolution. There's no spiritual revolution without the psychological revolution. And if you study all great movements in history, everyone, Chinese Revolution, French Revolution, Russian Revolution, Cuban Revolution, American Revolution, 
African Revolution, Vietnam Revolution, they all started with an educational system to transform the way the children thought. So if we're going to change, we have to change with the mind. You know, we want to change our spending habits. We want to change the situations between black men and black women. You're not going to get to none of that until you change the way we fundamentally we gonna, think about we, ourselves. Right. We're going to talk about some of that stuff today, though. Yes, sir. For sure. But I want to start with Deion Sanders. Mm -hmm. You went to the Breakfast Club, and I want to roll this clip because I want you to uh, kind of further speak about what we saw here on the Breakfast Club. Let's pay attention. He never said I could be gone in three years. What does it matter though? His contract is I'm gonna before. tell you why it matters. I'm about to tell you right now okay. why it matters. Because he damn wrong. Now, if he told them, if I'm gonna go back and study some more, but from what I seen him say, he was not that direct. But he if he was, was, if he was, mm -hmm. and that's not what I saw, so I, we disagree there. But if he was, he's still wrong, but it's a low level because at least you was transparent and you gave him informed consent. Mm -hmm. They knew you could leave at any time. That's right. Okay? Still wrong. I'm going to explain in a minute. Now, if he didn't tell them that, okay, and I'm hearing from people who know athletes on that team that they were not told it that way. They weren't listening. And they're upset. Because he said that on 60 Minutes. Okay. He didn't say it that way, Charlamagne. I yes, saw he that. Did. He That's did. Not. Exact no, he quote. didn't. Exactly. Now, if he did not do it that way, that automatically means that Deion Sanders used, abused, and exploited HBCU Jackson State just to be given an opportunity to show predominantly white institutions that he could coach. If he only used them as a stepping stone to getting a job at a white college, he was dead wrong. Sanders. Now, let me the reason I'm so personally disappointed in Dion is I thought he was there for a movement, not for money. Meaning, Dion Sanders, the coach of Jackson State, I foresaw a situation where Dion would hire other coaches, other retired black NFL greats, to coach other HBCUs. In doing so, you attract our top tier high school athletes to come to Maybe. HBCU. Maybe. Stay with me. Eddie Jordan, that Stay State. with me. Stay with me. Football and back. You know like I know, if you got top tier NFL greats coaching HBCUs, the athletes are coming Maybe. just like they was coming for Dion. He showed you, Charlotte. Dion, though. He showed Dr. you. Uma. And his other one's Dion just one as great. one of the most famous people ever. And his other one's just as great. So listen. Eddie George at Tennessee State. That's one person. We talking about a system, not an individual. So, depending on white money, you got HBCUs at risk of being closed. I read something that said almost a half of them a half may not survive the decade so this was bigger than football this was about the survival of the hbcu it's than especially Dion, though, no yes, no, it is. I no. <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to play that um and i want you to build on that some for those of you unaware with that clip and just to give some context and some groundwork around it that clip was in reference to dr umar's opinion about Deion sanders leaving jackson state and headed up to Colorado to coach that team. You mind building on that? I want us to have that conversation. Uh, sure. Uh, first, I want to say that I have tremendous respect for Deion Sanders and what he's done. Uh, for a long time, he was my one of my favorite NFL players. Uh, I have nothing negative to say about him as a human being or as a man. We're speaking about his obligation to the black community and what he was in position to do to help secure the legacy of HBCUs. Now, the other day, Deion Sanders. Hold on, before you go. Sure. Because I know you got a lot. Uh, you believe Deion can, can, can secure the future of HBCUs? I believe he had a strong chance of being able to lay the foundation for doing so, yes. So, laying the foundation and securing is different. We can uh, Not that. necessarily, because we have to see it in motion. But the point is. Deion Sanders was bringing top recruits to Jackson State. Right. I saw Deion Sanders as being the catalyst of a movement where ex-NFL greats and NBA greats would occupy the coaching ranks at the premier HBCU campuses, pulling all of our talent that is exploited by the PWI back to the HBCU. College athletics is a multi-billion dollar business. We have at least 40% of HBCUs right now in danger of being closed down. We tried to buy one. There's a few more that just closed down in the past year. 
If you lose the HBCU, you lose middle class black America. The HBCU is responsible for more than 50% of our attorneys, 50% of our engineers, 50% of our teachers, 50% of our doctors, if I didn't say that already. So the HBCU has single-handedly kept a professional class in black America. You just had a situation, as I mentioned to Charlemagne, where the Supreme Court just threw out affirmative action in college admission which means white colleges no longer have to pursue the black student anymore. That just made HBCUs more critical. If they don't survive, the black middle class and or professional class doesn't survive. When Dion showed up at Jackson State, and I've spoke to players after that interview, players who told me Dion did not tell us he could leave. Not that quickly. Multiple okay. players. So, so, but at what point do but we... But let me finish that point. Go ahead. So therefore, you come to this HBCU, you see the change that you're able to generate. Why not systematize this so the HBCU can now compete with the Alabamas and the Florida States for that football revenue, that basketball revenue, those top recruits. And now the HBCU doesn't have to worry about handouts and contributions from alumni and celebrity blacks because you're now bringing in enough revenue on an annual basis from your athletic programs the same way Duke and Carolina do to sustain the university. Deion Sanders could have went down in history as one of the greatest black men in American history. You don't think so? Had he, say that again. You don't think he's still going down in history? As an athlete, but that's irrelevant to me. I don't care about athletes, I care about black success. As a coach, you don't think he's going down? As what as coach? As a coach. He may. I don't know what the future holds, but that's not important to me. So what is he? What would he? Because oh, you're athletics, saying, you're saying, okay. athletics does not in any way, shape, form or fashion compare to black survival and success. I don't care how many trophies you got, how many rings you got. That does not compare to where we end up as as a people is is sports athletics, a portal or a, a portal to power, though. How is it a port of the pot when less than 50% of black division one male athletes graduate within four to five years and at least 40% of them never graduate at all? They exploit them for four years and they back in the hood selling crack and weed. How is that a port of the power? Yeah, I understand that. But at the same time, I feel as though someone like Deion Sanders can come through that and continue to elevate. I don't so see Deion that. Sanders bragging the other day that gained the home opener for the University of Colorado Boulder, Colorado, with a black percentage of 1.3%. Cracker land. 1.3% black people in Boulder. Y'all know King Kong was coming. 1.3% black people in Boulder, Colorado. 2.6% black students at the University of Colorado. Dion bragging that the home opener made $18 million. What did that do for us? I heard. I, I mean, I understand that, but I think it's. I think he's thinking about his journey. The same. His. Way, hold on. The same way you're thinking about your journey. No, my life is for the people. So, Everything I do is for the people. All right. I understand, and, and you, you know we're going to have some clapping and all of that. Ooh, You're going to have it. It's funny to me. Because I'm the realest man in black America. Hey, listen, listen, what, what we're going to talk about is the truth, though. Because we're dealing with the truth. We have to live in reality. We're not, the claps don't make us right or wrong, right? <laughs> what we have to focus on is the truth. You're telling me, you're telling me that your life, so if, if that was the truth, if your life was all for the people, you'll live at that school. You wouldn't have a home. I probably won't go home once the school opens. Before it opens, you would take the money from your home and put it in the school. I have. All of it. Just about. See, that's what I'm saying. So there's, about. But there's room to think about yourself. Yes, but yourself does not take precedence over the people. My life is for the people. It is not about personal achievement. So you don't Nothing wrong with that. Here's what I'm saying. Because I don't want to make it all about Dion. You understand? Right, right. This is a systemic problem we have as black people where we never subvert the personal agenda for the best interests of the race. That's where we have to go. Chinese, the race come first. European Jews, the race come first. Arabs, the race come first. And with black people, ourselves come first. And that's why we can't win because all power is in the group. Teamwork makes the dream work. 
<laughs> hey, y'all, y'all are funny, man. Y'all are so funny. And you know, you know they were gonna do this, cause you're powerful with this talking Nashville, thing. Nashville, make some noise. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I brought you though, Umar, because again, the way you speak, I think you're one of the most brilliant speakers in the world. But Appreciate again, you. I want us to hammer this point down. You don't sleep at the school, right? Well, remember. You do have a life outside of the school, outside of the mission, outside I have of- a school, I have a life outside of the school, but I don't have a life outside of the mission. There's nothing I do on a daily basis that isn't directly tied to the liberation of African people. I don't know. Give me something. I don't know your daily. You give me your daily <laughs> routines. I don't give know. I, it's, I find that, I mean- I'm at the airport today coming here. I'm on the phone consulting with a mother because they're trying to expel her special ed son illegally because they never done a manifestation determination. They never gave him the behavior plan that the IEP law requires him to have for them to even consider the expulsion. Then I'm on the phone with another mom trying to help us save her son. People call me two, three o'clock in the morning with mental health and educational emergencies. You understand? So I'm not saying that I am the most devout black man on the planet. I'm just saying if it ain't me, I don't know who it is. <laughs> All right, so back, let's get back to Dion, because you popping some, you popping it right now. Let's get back to Dion. So, so oh, oh, in all actuality with Dion, I feel as though when I look at even people like, business doesn't have moral claws in it, right? So No, European business doesn't have and moral that's what And that's what the colleges are, right? Ain't that the European structure? Okay. All right, so we're speaking about the, again, situational awareness. You cannot ignore the facts. Dion is inside of a structure and a system that he has to play a certain game the same way you do. So Dion had to lead Jackson to go to all white Colorado because he's in the system? Yeah. No. Dion. I believe Dion to be chasing a dream. I believe Dion to be chasing a position for him, his family, and then the mission. I believe the mission is still in the car with Dion. Sometimes when I hear you talk what is about the mission? the mission for him is saving kids. At an all white school, who he saving black up there? Who Dion saving? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they go, they go, you Who Dion saving at the University of Colorado? He's saving children, though. Look. His son. His there they go. Whose son? His. Did you save your daughter? Of course. All right, but so not that, at the I expense. don't like. Hold on. Not at the uh, once, expense. You keep not on. At the what expense. I think, listen, it comes off disingenuous for me when you try to act like. I'm going to put y'all in front of me and mine. I got to save me and mine. He got his son with him. I he is know, on I a didn't mission. I didn't know Deion Sanders was broken poor in the hood. No, not at all. Okay, But then. my mission so, ain't accomplished. You ain't broken poor, but your mission ain't accomplished. Okay. So every day we wake up, we go towards the mission. How is his mission tied to the white college? His mission is tied to success and results. You're looking for at who? it. For him and his family, his for son. Him and his family. What about so, the community? Again, that's still on the agenda, but it's here at an all white school. Where is the community on the agenda? Where is the black community on the agenda at Boulder, Colorado? So what I did, if I'm Deion Sanders, I come into Jackson State and lay a blueprint. I break a mold. I do something that's never been done before you and to that ask was? me. That's for, th what you just spoke to. You spoke to him bringing all his revenue, bringing these and athletes. And he was there for how long? That's, that's, that's not what we're speaking about. No, it is what we're speaking of. Okay. Because it shows a lack of commitment. No, no, See, no, no. See, here's the Opportunity issue. Opportunity you know call. You know what the bigger issue is here? Go ahead. What do we value more? Building systems of success for young black children or being accepted by white people? That's what this is about. Dion went to Colorado not for the money because he wanted to prove to white people he could coach white children. The, that, that's not right. Look at all them. Look at look. Oh, it is right. Look, look, look. Did y'all see all the celebrities who was at that game last week? Did y'all see them flying all the way to Boulder, Colorado? Why they don't come to Tennessee State like that for your homecoming? Why they not at Howard like that? Why they not at South Carolina State? You know why? Because it was a white school. Oh, it's the same reason why entertainers will go to the Grammys and go to the AMAs, but they'll start fights 
at the uh, Source Awards and the BETs because we value white people. We want to be accepted by white people. Dion wanted white people to know he could coach at a white school. I think this is miscategorization, Mr. Ooh, Dr. No, it's I think the what, truth. I think what, what Dion wanted was to show that he could be successful in collegiate sports. He could have done I that think, in Jackson. I think because that, well, he did it in Jackson. This and is it, the point I'm making. Two years, was it? Yeah, two he years. did it, and he did it. He did it. So what I'm saying is, though. Brother, come on. Listen. He, he used he, them to get seen, known, to go to a white college. And you know what I think, y'all? I believe the white power structure sat down, had a meeting, and said, we got to put an end to this. Yeah. If we let Dion stay at Jackson, and he start pulling Ed Reed and Randall Cunningham and all these ex war, all these ex NFL greats to these HBCUs. They gonna steal our money. This is a billion dollar empire. We cannot afford for the HBCU to steal all the top tier athletes because there will be a reversal of power in D1 sports. This is what they said. And they oh, said, no, we know Dion ain't the loyal type to the black community because he the one who also criticized Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to get the whitest school in the country to offer him some money to come teach them because he could have went somewhere. They were making a statement. Dion was sent to Colorado to make a statement that every one of them ninjas got a price. Find his and pay him off. You know what I think? I think. And, and they listen. See them faces? You see, look. Talk to me about hey, y'all, y'all, y'all feel him. Listen, when he sit back and do you like it, bro. When he sit back and do you like this right here, he kicking the highest game he can kick right there, as high as he can get, boy. But it's it's effective. Listen, I think I, what I what I believe is that in college sports we have to be effective to get higher, to do certain things. Just like you, I'm still want, I want you to look at it through your lens and the things you've been able to do and ha how you had to exit certain routes. You had black people um, come and try to fix your school up and you mm -hmm. had an issue with that. Sometimes mm -hmm. the power structure calls for us to need a handoff, need an assist, need something to that put us in a position. Black contract is scheming and scamming. Ain't got nothing to do with Dion running to 1.3% well, black. This is what I'm saying Boulder, about Colorado. So, so here, 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 let's let's wrap that around. HBCUs and business in general, not HBCUs, but business in general has no moral clause. I disagree with that. Tell From me, a European standpoint, what? yes, we ain't Europeans. Our business always have a clause. What you get, so for us to not to have access to power, what business or industry do we even control? We are two trillion dollar people. What brother. business or industry we do don't, we control? And that's the problem. And we okay, so what? Right, so his we access to school for the white ones. His access to power goes through Boulder, Colorado. Goes through the power structure. All this money Dion making for them. By the time he's done, he would have made far more for them. That he earned from them. Not only that, God forbid. That's everything. If he ever begin, but the point is, he shouldn't even be in that position because you had the chance to restructure an entire HBCU athletic system permanently, and you sold it out for money to go to a white college. That's the facts of the situation. I disagree with that. It's the facts. It's undisputable. That's what he did. That's dumb. Why he not still at Jackson? He's not at Jackson because he had an opportunity call. An opportunity to go teach at, to coach at a white school. No, to showcase his skills on, in a different level. Oh, we don't know what Dion is capable of. No, not in college. Not listen. Not, not again. You have to coach in these different markets. The same way you got to go speak in different markets. Same way I got to podcast. But I don't compromise. It ain't about compromise. It is. He it's about results. I keep telling you, I'm showing up to show out. Results. I ain't showing up to do that other Results stuff. Results for who? For my for my stat sheet, for what for I've been able to sheet. do. Yeah, so if he's... They if, trying to turn black people to a permanent underclass. Are you talking about stat sheets? Burn the damn stat sheets. Nah, you need that, don't do more. If that's the case, you would you would sleep in the mop room at your school. I will be. See, I don't think see I'll what ever saying? leave once I get These there. are future plans, but this dude here is working now. I'm telling you, if you, believe what, you're, if you believe what you're telling me, you will walk in that school and say, damn it with the house. Damn it with the car. Until this school get up and rolling, Uma don't got nothing. Well, I agree with everything. All right, so, so I'm, that's, that's my but point. you can't compare my commitment to the black community 
to Dion's because he has yet to show it. You don't think he's saving children? Doing what? Being the motivation. <laughs> Continue. I'll rest my case. Oh, so you don't think motivation is necessary? Brother, to whom much is given, much is required. You're telling that to me, and I got a lot. Dion has a lot. Yeah. So for you to tell me that he's somehow benefiting black children because they see him winning at a white college, that's the same argument Obama maniacs made nah. when Barack was in the White House and Negro said just him being there was a benefit to black people. Only problem with that, it didn't play out in the statistics. High school graduation didn't go up. Crime didn't go down. You understand? We didn't do better on a single index in this country as a result of Obama being in the White House. So now you're giving me Dion on a white football field, Barack Obama in a white man's house. Listen. They're clapping for nothing. They're clapping for nothing. No. they clapping for the truth. They're clapping for nothing. It's, and it's, it's hard. It's hard because you're not even getting through it and they're clapping. So I know they're clapping for nothing. No, no, no. They Listen. hear me, but, but more than hearing me, they feel Feel me. Yeah, they feel you. I feel you. I, I believe you to I believe you to be the truth, like I always say. Yes, sir. But I'm telling you that I believe you not to believe what you're saying. I don't believe that you truly believe that someone should put everything they have into the mission. I don't I don't Why see not? you doing That's the only that. Way we win. I don't see you doing it though. You don't see me doing it. No. Okay. Show me another psychologist who has done more to change the way black parents deal with. The mental health and school system in this country. I haven't seen. I know what you do. And for the sake of conversation, no let me push back. In history. For the sake of conversation, history, I will push back. Where's the result? Show me some numbers. Show me something tangible I can look at. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to have every parent I've ever saved and child I help email you directly. <laughs> and, then, and then you can take it from there, my brother. All right. And I'll definitely have it. I'll pull it up on, on, Black the, power. on the interview. <laughs> Black You power. see, and, and, and here's the... And, black and, and, power yesterday, black power today, and black power tomorrow. But most of all, most of all, black queens forever, snow bunnies never! <laughs> Y'all get Dr. Umar Johnson in rare form tonight. Y'all get Dr. Umar Johnson in rare form. So, so, um... How far, how far are you willing to go for your children? As far as the mission requires. See, here's the thing. We have different value systems, right? And the problem with black people is we operate on a platform of selfishness and individual agenda. Every other group, the culture comes first. The culture comes first. Could you imagine? If Deion Sanders was at a historically Mexican college <laughs> and he got an offer to go to Boulder, Colorado and turn his back on the Mexican students at the Mexican college on the Mexican football team, he would have never done Why it. Why is this looked at like turning your back? I just, he because took a he job. He but took but a because job. he did. He had a chance to make a structural, systemic, historic change in the benefit of so black you athletes. believe you you believe that they would have let him make that change but you don't believe that we have that access to any power but he could have made that change what single -handedly. access to power at boulder colorado no it's not a finished product this is what i'm okay, saying okay what will the finished you continue product look to, like but we don't know but he's on a journey the same a way journey See, here's, the a thing I find, here's the thing i find disingenuous you were someone that started a school. You mm -hmm. went through criticism. Uh -huh. Every move. You were trying to the movement. And here, so I'm here's another black man. I'm building a black school. He had a white college. How you comparing them? Listen. He, I know Deion Sanders had a charter school. He never owned an independent school like I do. It listen, was a charter li listen, school. Li listen. It was a charter school. It was a charter school. Well, hold, hold, Do you know what a charter on, school Hold on, sweetheart. We'll give y'all a chance. Charter we'll, schools we'll give y'all a chance to speak. Sister. You know, we are live recording. Charter schools are publicly owned. We the are Frederick live Douglas recording. The Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is independently owned by black But people. I'm saying, listen, back back to what charter I'm saying. School. Hey, uh, Umar. LeBron James, uh, Umar. charter school. Dr. Umar Johnson. Charter school. Dr. Umar Johnson. 
Know what you say? Dr. Nigga. Umar Johnson. I'm with you. Stop she it. She was wrong. I had to clarify. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Listen, though. Who owns it? Listen. Who owns it? Listen. Who owns it? Hey, hold on, sweetheart. I'm so, we'll give you an opportunity. I'm going to give you a mic in just no a second. That's a charter school. Listen, though. You, you're judging Deion Sanders, and this is Can not a finish. We will in a minute, but but I don't. Hey, hold on. Now, hey, man. I love my hold brother. on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. I love my brother. This is my show. Let's 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 remember that. <laughs> this is long show. Don't y'all can clap all you want. We have to talk about the things I want to talk about. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry. Right, Doctor Umar. Because I haven't finished this point. I really want us to spend some time in. We got a lot to talk about. Yeah. But in particular. I just don't want it to look like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to dig. I know out. these guys. They know this is. I'm just trying to get information. And yes, I sir. want you to speak to them. Yes, sir. If, as, it's, if it's, if, as if he's watching. Mm -hmm. I want you to speak as if they're watching because they nine times out of ten are. You watch them. They yeah, all watch so them. I'm telling you, this is, this is important to me. So I'm now. I'm saying that I feel as though it's unfair for you to judge Deion Sanders in this current position as he is on the journey the same way you were on your journey for 12 years to build a school that some people say should have took one year. Okay. Now, you, But people, how can they say that if they never built it? You've never did what he did. He never done what I'm doing. So again, why are you speaking? Well, what is he doing? He's going to a white college. No, a lot of black coaches went to a white college. What do you mean? No, no, no. He's breaking the code of what it looks like to be a head coach. He's trying to get to a he head coach. the first coach black head coach of no, a white school? No, no, no. He's the first you of his kind. Him. He's the first of his kind. Okay. He's a different kind okay. of coach. Okay. And at the end of the day, what, what are you expecting to come out of Dion? What does he change being a coach at this white school? Let's say Dion goes 30 years undefeated. What the hell did he change for black people at that all-white school? I mean, that's a loaded question. You can change a no, lot of things. No, it ain't loaded. Yeah, see, you can't tell me what a loaded question is. These are tactics, and I know you're a great speaker. Stop the tactics. You know, the, the this, the this. These are tactics. We, no tactics. Yeah, these are tactics, so we want to just have a... Now, listen, I believe him... Let's just move off, Dion, because I yes, feel as though... Please. Hey, look, I feel as though... You, you clap too much, we going back. <laughs> clap too much, we going back. Let's talk about ESPN and Fox. What we saw with Shad and Sharp, um, according Bayless. to yeah, according to Stephen A. Smith, uh, Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp had a run in and he was let go. Um, this news just came out. A lot of people thought he was he left on his own or on some kind of good. So Shannon merit. and Skip had a run in. Yeah, there was some argument live Backstage. about. No, no, okay, no. the live show. I, I remember about, that. About, yeah, yeah, and so I think that bled over to behind the scenes and led okay. into. Okay. Eventually, those two guys not being able to coexist. Mm -hmm. um, Shannon Shaw is now on uh, ESPN. Stephen A. Smith broke the news that he was asked to leave. Um, what, what do you think about people like Shannon Sharp si sitting next to someone like Skip Bayless and providing that um, type of style and swag to those? I think the Shannon Sharp, Skip Bayless situation is so symbolic for black people in America on many levels because Shannon was a better commentator than Skip. He made the show, but because Skip was the privileged white man, Shannon made the mistake of outshining the master. And within the white power structure, you're not allowed to do that. And so Skip was willing to cut off his fingers to teach Shannon a lesson that you never, never go against the white hand that feeds you. And so it was unfortunate, but I'm glad Shannon is gone because to me, I believe he was selling himself short, constantly trying to play humble black man to this arrogant white man. You think he played humble up there? I've seen he him He did do many some. a times. And you saw it on, on y'all saw him yeah. when he kept trying to ingratiate himself to skip. He tried to win skip Give me some example. Over. Give me an example. Just in the in the, in, in the nonverbals, mm, in the language, mm, in the deference. Mm. He always tried to make sure he didn't go too far mm. in challenging skip. He always started the shows with the with the with the with the, with the hand, Pound, yeah. the pan. Yeah. You know, he wanted it. He didn't want to leave. I think Shannon tried to win Skip back over, but Skip being the slave master he is, mm. he needed to teach Shannon a lesson. And although his ratings are going to drop, 
In Skip's mind, it was well worth it because in the mind of a white man, what good am I if I can't even check a black man? So that was all about race and it was about power. And I think Shannon may have not fully understood the rules of racism. And the first rule of racism is all white people are racist. And the second rule of racism, white people don't share power with black people. So the minute Shannon wanted an equitable power sharing in the conversation on Undisputed, he had to go. Skip had to let him know, we are not partners. I'm the slave, you're the slave, and I'm the slave master. Mm. Shannon tried to break the code change the power dynamic. White people don't do well with you changing power dynamics because at the end of the day, all they have is their white privilege over and above you. But with that being said, and I love my brother Shannon Sharp, I think he got a good heart, but until he stopped running around with them damn snow bunnies, <laughs> I'll never be able to give him the total respect that he deserves. I think he's a good brother, but he got he to gotta heal whatever went on with him and his children's mother, ex-wife, whatever. But for him to be as dark as he is, and to only be running around with white women, it's a disgrace to the race. <laughs> so love isn't, love isn't love to Dr. Umar Johnson. If love is love, why don't we see rich white women marrying broke ass black men? If love is love. Does that speak to, what, what are you saying with that? I'm saying what white woman married to a black man has ever done anything significant to help black people? Kobe Bryant's widow, Vanessa, who inherited over a billion dollars worth of his wealth, she just did a HP, excuse me, a college partnership in Kobe's name. And all five colleges she chose to be part of this Kobe Bryant thing were white. She didn't choose a single black college for this black man's money who didn't attend a college at all. Isn't college the European power structure? Why, so do we participate with it or not? Like at some no. points we hear, yo, get outside the power structure, create your own. Then other that moments the we hear, that yo, you should have stayed at that HBCU yes, in the white power structure because yes, you still could have utilized it. But if you go to this other school, you're in the white power structure and you can do nothing. I'm like, I'm confused as to why the power- be confused. Okay, because he can't clarify. do anything in Boulder, Colorado. At Jackson State, he could have did a lot. What we're talking about is Kobe Bryant's widow no. taking his black man's money and not using any of it to support HBCU. I know black people ain't supporting nothing with their money. Okay, so do I. But that wasn't the point. So it ain't about the skin about, color. It's about the No, intention. it is about skin color. It's always about race. It's black Everything people, in America no. is about race. It's black people that don't help black people. And I ain't been helped by... Because they've been taught not to help black okay, people. Okay, so if that's and the... And who taught them not to help black people? It's still situational who awareness. Who conditioned them not to help still black people? still the same who situation. Who trained them not to help black people? There's a history to self-hatred. I'm not exempting black people. But any problem we got, if you don't start with a plantation analysis, you off base. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm telling you that it's not just being black that makes you contribute to the cause. And I think you're framing you it like be black and conscious, black so, and so, conscious. All right, so you got black people with money that don't check the conscious box. They do nothing for the black community. That's true. So if we can't just say if you're black and in a position that you're going to do something. But you can't scapegoat psychologically dysfunctional Negroes from the fact that they exist in a white racist power structure. The power structure is still the power structure whether you commit it or not. That's and the point. only way we're going to get black people to be focused on building their own institutions and systems is to build our own institutions and systems. That's what Dion could have helped us do at Jackson State. No, because but he Col chose Snow Bunny Boulder, Colorado. No. <laughs> See, and this is, where, this is where I just think you just tripped yourself up. Because you're still telling Dion to participate in an HBCU system. Yes, I am. Okay, so there, there we are. You still in the, so how can you do something if the system is the system no matter where you go? A black system is a black system. A white so system. So now you're saying college, is a if it's an HBCU, is a black system. The HBCUs grew out of a legacy of enslavement. You understand? Yeah, me? but that, you know, they how were it. built to give black people the opportunity to learn how to make it in this world. They are discriminated against, they are ignored, and they are being marked for extermination. Deion Sanders was at an HBCU at a time where they really could have used him 
to stay put and create a system that would have revolutionized the financial system of Division One sports. That's all I'm saying. What do you and think the about cho chose money? What do you think about female rap? What do I think about female rap? Be more specific. This, the I think over -sexualizing. all gangster rap is hell. So we're not, we'll get to gangster rap. I want to focus on female. Well, they rap. gangster raps too, ain't they? <laughs> so so so. It's kind of over-sexualized people to say that it's, it's reached a certain Absolutely. height that, that is uncomfortable for certain Absolutely. people. Pre-pornographic. Mm. So you have no, you, you, I mean, what's your thoughts on it? Just pre, that's it. It's pre, if I were in charge, there would be no gangster rap and there would be no soft pornography rap. It'll all be exterminated. And one of the biggest contradictions I see right now as we celebrate the 50 years of hip hop is I don't hear nobody having a conversation on how hip hop has hurt black America. Gangster rap is the marketing scheme for the mass incarceration of black males. And nobody's saying nothing about it. 50 years of gangster rap, 50 years of hip hop. Most of the money made by Jewish publishing houses. Not a single black institution, relevant black institution, and let me tell you what relevant institutions are. Schools, banks, hospitals, supermarkets, manufacturing and distribution centers. 50 years, billions of dollars, the most influential music form on earth. And in 50 years, they haven't built a single institution for black people. Throw it in the trash. So that's gangster rap. And I've, I've, I've heard you also say that they're flaunting and, and certain things you feel as though that they're um, almost shitting on Oh, yeah. Black people the, who, the, who are the, the main message of gangster rap is I made it out the ghetto. You didn't. And I'm going to flaunt to you what I have that you may never get. It's about making yourself look important to people who don't have much. Now, by you. Uh, see, you made a lot of money off. Do you know you I made a lot of money off what? Yeah, I got you. Just hold what you got. Do you know that? Do, do you know that? Do you know that you've made a lot of money in like a, the motivational space? Do you know people view you as like like some sort? They they pull motivation from you. Do you not recognize? Of course, that? I'm the greatest black speaker on the planet right now. And eh? okay, so when when you say that when you say that, and let's let's hold off on some of that, Doctor Umar. We'll have to now just. But but seriously. Um, People look but at you. But I don't you, make much money from that. I make no, my money from you my get your brand visibility though from that. See, that's that's okay. value that goes in different buckets, especially when you're building my a brand. credentials. Pay the bills, not the work for the no, people. No, no, bro, you can't tell me that, Umar. Don't do no, that. That's to a me. fact. That no, is it's absolute not, fact. no, no, it's not a fact. Because it's a lot of school psychologists. Because it's a lot of school psychologists. It's a lot of people with your your um, attributes uh -huh. Uh -huh. that don't make the kind of money you make. And if they did pay the bills, then you wouldn't take bookings the way you do. No, no, okay. I'm not gonna break down my bookings. Right. I'm just gonna say that a lot of what I do in the community is done at zero cost. I don't charge a penny to go into the prisons. I don't charge a penny to go into the halfway houses. I don't charge last a penny Last time you've been to a prison or a halfway house? About a month ago, last month. I don't charge a penny to go to Africa. To How go do you to know what to charge for and what not to charge for? Well, because I'm a doctor, I can charge for everything that I do. But I'm saying I don't charge for anything when I leave the country. No. Yeah. How and do I don't you charge for anything when I work with vulnerable populations? So if one of them call me up right now and say, Dr. Uma, I work at the youth prison. Can you come down here to Nashville and speak to my boy? Sure, just cover the plane ticket. I'm not going to charge you a penny. I've never charged for those things. Right. So how do you know what and to charge for years? and what not to charge for? If, if, do you charge for like because okay I don't charge for vulnerable populations so if you are helping people help themselves I'm not going to exploit that I'm coming for free just get me there that's it okay again I, I want you to know that and you, I didn't even charge for my speaking for the first 10 years you know when I started to charge for my speaking when it started taking me away from my psychological services and then I had to make Man, If you're making so much money on psychological services, why the hell am I going to come speak for free? Or, or no, let me, because I know what you're going to say. This is about the mission. So I'm saying, <laughs> if I'm, if, if, if I'm, Shut up! if I'm making so much money on the, on, on the psychology, why the hell am I speaking for 10 years for free? <laughs> you, tr you, you got, <laughs> 
Tell me why are you interested in speaking at all? And I'm trying because to be I was respectful. Born. You guys don't make me My, be this. I, I, I was sitting here. By the ancestors. Disrespectful means just turn up in my con. Give me a second, Dr. Umar. Disrespectful means turn up in my content. This is a show that I'm having. So we're this. Yeah, we're, we brothers. Yeah, we, brothers. we real tight. So this is right. So disrespectful means turn up in my show. And I shouldn't have stopped, but I want to address that. Continue. I'm sorry. I believe that I was sent here. Part of my mission is to raise the consciousness. And the voice is the greatest weapon to do that. I was never taught how to speak. In fourth grade black history class, there was an oratorical contest in North Philly. I'm from Bill Cosby's neighborhood. And I got into the public speaking contest. I won first place, and I just never shut up. I was born to speak. I'm related to Frederick Douglass. He was a great orator. It runs in my family. It's, it's why I'm here. You follow? So my speaking is more of a ministry of black consciousness. It heals and it helps and it motivates and it transforms people. I believe that's part of why I'm here, but it's not the only reason I'm here because we've had great orators all throughout our history. But what we have to do is build institutions and leave a legacy. That's what we have to do. The speaking is good, but it's not going to save us. The speaking is to get your attention so I can organize you for transformation. Okay, so... Do you, I, I, I believe again, man, I, I don't know if you, I think you know this. I think you just, you, you're in this, you, 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 you get into this spot, right? Where you, uh, almost like you're into, you get in character. Not that you're faking, but you get into this like spot where you just, it's all about the mission. It's all about it's the, all, it's always about but the, I, but I think, I think your results. When I'm eating, when see, I'm in the shower. Yeah, see, he's playing into it. See, this is playing into it's it. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. So, yeah, yeah. This is playing into it. Talk to anybody who know me. They'll tell you. Yeah. No, nah, I'm, I'm with you, and I've been knowing you, so yes. I know you want it. It ain't, it ain't that. But I do. It's, I just it's not fake with me. No, nah, I, but I do think that there's room to discuss that there's other things on your agenda that don't coincide with the mission like 100. Give me Give me Again, we went to that, so I want, I want to move past that. Let's talk Go about your content creation. I was telling you backstage that you are one of the most visible people online. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do to keep your content valuable and not oversaturated? Uh, nothing. Until the conversation we had. Now you're giving me things I need to think about based on our conversation we had earlier backstage. Right. But until this point, I never looked at my content as a means to monetization or, or, or money. It's purely to wake up our people. Uh, purely to give them an alternative view. It's purely to let them know that they're not crazy when they see things that isn't making sense. So it's been, I never knew that I would be what I am on social media. I never heard, I, knew, I didn't even know what TikTok was. So people say, you need to get on TikTok because you all over it. Right. I didn't know. You know, um, I don't have a YouTube page, right? So I didn't know social media would respond to me the way that it has, especially given my views which many people would consider to be radical or controversial. So that was purely an act of God that I've been able to have that type of presence online standing for what I stand for. I never expected that in my wildest dreams. And you know what I find interesting? You came from a, a crop or a batch of conscious community where it was very strong. Mm -hmm. I said Umar is probably one of the only ones that's been able to transcend that mm -hmm. run. A lot of those guys kind of have faded away. You still yeah. see the Candace Owens. Yeah. You still see you, and I believe that's about where it stops at. Yeah. What do you, I, what do you contribute that to? I, I, I think a lot of it has to do with my expertise as a school psychologist. It's kind of hard to separate my impact from my profession. Because if I was not a school psychologist, if I couldn't help parents help their children, if I couldn't mm. evaluate, if I couldn't diagnose, mm. if I couldn't teach them about the medications, if I couldn't help them with the IEPs, if I couldn't review the psychological evaluations, would I be as relevant? I don't know. That's some people would say yes. Some people would say no. It's no way to know because I've never not been the school psychologist, you see. And so I, I, it's hard to separate the two. Although I think presently, though, I, I definitely think Dr. Umar the Pan-African is, is a much more popular person than Dr. Umar the psychologist. But I think Dr. Umar the psychologist 
is more valuable in that parents clearly see in me someone who can help them. And you know what I think it is, and this is old fashioned for anybody in content creating, it's like literally add value, whatever you're doing. And so I think with, the, with you really having the background in understanding the medicines and understanding psychology, I think that value mm -hmm. did set you apart because a lot yeah. of people was just talking. Yes. When you get with in the no meeting, but yeah, yes. you get in the meeting potatoes and you really Understood. I remember you used to walk around with the big DS, yeah, uh, DSM five, DSM five yeah. book, and so these kind of things I think made you kind of reign supreme in yeah. regards to those those yes. guys that laid there. It seemed like the talking just subsided. Yes, it just kind of went yes. away. Yes. Um. Have you? I mean, the documentary era was a boom for y'all. Do y'all you still get paid for any of those things? Nah, I've never produced my own documentary, and the ones that I was in. Uh, I never really made anything off of those. That's uh, what I was talking to you back, utilizing your own packaging for you, because your brand is so big. Like everyone knows yeah. you. You're one of the most yeah. popular black people in the world, but it's the packaging. That's why people can come and package you and sell it. Yeah. Right? People can come and say, yo, I'm going to get Dr. Umar on my DVD and I'm going to go get a bag. Yeah. But Dr. Umar should be able to put that DVD together yeah. with, with that voice. And to your point, I definitely think I've lost out financially by being so giving. But at the same time, I would not do anything different because I don't think we get that school built if people didn't know my heart was real. Uh, I don't think I would be as popular as I am globally if people didn't know my heart was real. So I don't regret any of it. Uh, you know, even now, people say, hey, you got to redirect your content on YouTube. You got about five different pages uh, misrepresenting themselves as you making money off of you. And we'll, we will get to that. But at the same time, that's how people came to know who I was by people posting the content. So, so you got to lose a little bit to get a little you gotta bit. You got to lose, yes, yes. You Just like lose. Dion. Yes. <laughs> that ain't got nothing to do. I don't, Let me do what he be doing. I don't. Cut it out! <laughs> no, nah, but but I don't know. It just wrapped back around to that. But but feel, seriously, feel, yeah. you you know you you have to lose a little bit to get a little bit. You were you were in content wars with a lot yeah. of guys. Yeah. What was that era like for you? Uh, I had a beef every year around Christmas. <laughs> it was always try to pay Christmas. the YouTube bill. Try to get the YouTube check. That's what they. I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To my supporters, said stop responding. Because if you notice, they always attack you around Christmas so they can get their views up and get that Christmas money to buy their woke kids some white Jesus gifts. But <laughs> it was always, see, when I came into the conscious community, right, I came unexpectedly. I didn't know I was about to blow. I just blew. I didn't know nothing about it. I thought I would just be a psychologist for the rest of my life, doing my Pan-Africanism, but I never knew I would become this, right? So when I blew up, there were people who had their niches. You had people who had the mental health niche, the uh, black consciousness niche, the Pan-African niche, the economics niche. And me, I do them all. So a lot of people felt like I was stepping on their toes, especially the younger guys. And so they would attack me every Christmas. And because I'm King Kong consciousness, I had to, you know, beat my chest a little bit <laughs> and let them know I'm from the hood, too. Yeah. You know what I mean? But uh, when do you stop that? Like, because for me right now, when I it, realized they were doing it on purpose to make money, it wasn't even genuine beef. It was strategic yeah, beef yeah. to get his response, to get his listeners. Yeah, so now I don't I don't even respond because yeah. I know. Right. Now, here's the thing. When you have a legitimate issue with someone like you do sometimes uh -huh. when you speak on things that's really near and dear, like this is what I'm seeing. I don't, right or wrong, this is what I'm seeing. People can frame that in that way. So yeah. how do we keep it from, how do you keep it, how do you keep the authenticity of like, when I say something about Shannon, it ain't the same thing that they was doing to me, right? It ain't right. that that right. messy trying to steal the audience, trying to steal, right, get right, visibility, right, 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 right. clout chasing it, it, It's very different. Cause like when we spoke about Deion Sanders, I made it clear, I respect him as a brother. He one of my greatest football players. When we spoke about Shannon, I said, I think Shannon is a good brother, a marvelous human being. You know what I mean? So my thing is, I'm going to still big you up as my brother and just express my difference. Mm. When they came at me in a conscious community, they said he's a scammer. He's still in the fundraiser money. He's tricking it off in Europe, South Africa, Nigeria. You know, 
Then they said I didn't have no degrees. Right. Yeah, call him around, uh, uh, he made that. up all the degrees. He ain't related to Frederick Douglass. I mean, anything you can think of, they, they were trying to assassinate my character completely. Mm. You know, so it's completely different. Do you do you is there a worthy opponent out there? Not calling names, but right. I'm saying are there things for you to yeah, I will respond to that. Like um, I mean, if somebody says something that I think needs to be clarified for my supporters and the school donors, then I'll clarify it, no matter where it comes That's from. That's the thing, because it's the brand recognition and awareness that they tamper with, yeah, right? Yeah. They tamper with what people know you for. And, and yeah. that's why I'm talking to you about this, because for me, um, being in the podcast space and moving so quick, I find myself in, in content wars, right? Yes, with yes, people, yes. I'm like, yo, you dudes ain't built nothing, ain't done no business. Yes, yes, And yes. I'm watching, as you say, I'm yes. watching these shots coming, I'm saying, it's almost like I'm watching the authenticity melt. It's like these dudes don't know me and they say, what is yes. what's happening? And I've came in and got rich from talking. Yes. So it's not something that's for debate. Yes, sir. Yes, you know sir. what I'm saying? And yes, I'm building sir. something, the conversations I have, people honestly enjoying this information base. Yes, sir. Today we kicking it, but it's information inside of every episode. I feel as though Podcasts are almost like encyclopedias. You should be able to go and grab an episode at any moment and get something from that. I feel as though things are trans transitioning. All information will li live in some sort of audio form. Yes. Right? Yes, and so yes. I try to, I'm racing to that, but when I see myself in content wars with dudes who ain't built anything, but they brand tampering. Uh, so it's almost like, uh, it's like, damn, when do I, when do I really just go? Or when do I just say this? Just let them talk. Keep From building. my experience, it's best to let it go. You gain nothing by going to war with a smaller fish. You gain nothing by going to war with a smaller fish. And I had to learn that. What about a bigger fish? Because I got big fish out there. I got big fish. I'm going at it with. I got. Well, let me okay. let me re hold on because they'll take that and say I gave them props. So let me rephrase <laughs> that. I got people seasoned fish. Uh -huh. I got seasoned fish. That, that's after me. See, even if you got a seasoned fish, if you look at it from the art of war, what will this cost you in the long run is what you got to look at. Because that seasoned fish might want to go back and forth with you all the time. And you're not looking for a long term right. beef. Yeah. But if you drop out too soon, it'll look like you caved to you're the lost. pressure. Yeah. So you have to do a thorough analysis of how long they're going to draw this out, how deep they're going to go with it. And do I even want to entertain it at all? I used to look at your lives and say, I wonder is he, I thought you was conscious. But see, the more I talk to you, I know that you don't know the money that's floating I around don't. out there. I don't. When I'm sitting back there talking to you, like, yo, dude, you, you, you know, it's, you got six, seven pages. They doing a million a day. Like, this is thousands of dollars on People a daily basis. People stop in the airport all the time and say, you leaving too much money on the yeah, table. Yeah, and so, and so when I look at you, and at first I thought, I said, yo, these lives are like, Lost leaders for him. Almost like at Costco's, they 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 keep the hot dog 150, uh -huh. even though they losing uh -huh. on the hot dog. It's like uh -huh. I know when you come here, you are gonna get enough to want to see what's behind right. the curtain or in right. the rest of the store. And so at first, I thought you were using those more like marketing. But when uh, I talk to you, like and it's, yeah, yeah, like teasers, like yo, just a little bit, come no. get it. Nah, I never, I, never, I never did it for the money, man. Like even now, when I go live. I got to feel it. My lives ain't even scheduled. Just like, you know what? Eric and Mina caught our sister, a blue monkey. Oh, hell no. I was in Brussels, Belgium. I had to go live on that because that touched me. You know, the call What is sister. your thought about that? Let's talk about that. Uh, it speaks to the light skin supremacy complex that we still have in the black community. And by light skin supremacy, I don't mean light skin people because you could be a dark skin, light skin supremacy. Just a little more, right? A absolutely. Yes, yes. I know Follow. dark skin, purple blacks who don't want nobody around them except yellow people. You see that. So you could be a light-skinned supremacist and not be light-skinned. So it's not about light-skinned people. That has nothing to do with it. It's a consciousness, you see. And I thought it was wrong. It was bad. I'm glad they fired her for it. She apologized, but the apology to me seemed a little bit disingenuous and almost like a, a smack itself. It was kind of, it was kind of a, I didn't like the apology. I, I don't think it was humble at all. But that's the issue we got, colorism. I think black women have it worse than black men within the queendom. So we as black men, we don't really look at each other's complexion when we hanging out. You feel me? We don't care, right, brother, brother. Right. 
but with the sisters I've noticed. Mm. Sisters will look at the complexion of the women in their circle. You see? And, and, and the women in the circle who may not be the complexion they want can feel that get away from us energy. And that could be a dark skin circle or a light skin circle. Because even though light skin supremacy is more, is more prevalent, you have dark skin supremacy who hate light skin people, right? So it goes both ways, although there's more light skin supremacy than dark skin supremacy. And it's one of those evils, one of those psychological residuals from the plantation that I don't think we've really stepped on yet. And I don't think elders have really accepted the role they've played in the maintenance of skin color worship. Because I still come across grandparents who make comments about dark skin. I've seen grandparents show favoritism, even in my own family, to the darkers versus the lighters or the lighters versus the darkers. I've seen it. You know, I've seen how aunts and uncles will favor the light skin and the dark skin. I see it in the public schools. And of course, the educational research shows us teachers pay more attention to the children in the class who are lighter. And so you could, you could go in some schools. Hold say, on, say that again. Teachers pay more attention to the children in their classroom unconsciously who are lighter. The darker kids get less attention. There's been research done and it has wow. consistently, yeah. You could go, go to an emotional support class and go to the mentally gifted class. The emotional support class tends to be a few shades darker and the mentally gifted class tends to be a few shades lighter. Because guess what? If you dark, we're not even testing you for mentally gifted. It's a very strong, wow. and because most teachers in America are white women, that means when a black boy walks, dark-skinned black boy, when he walks into the class, he's already been condemned from the start. Yeah, and I've, I, I've seen this. Yeah. This is a real thing. Yes. The dark-skinned, nappy-haired yes. boy. Yes, big nose. Oh, big oh yeah. man, he go through master. hell. Yes. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah. I've seen, this he is a real for, thing. Yes, yes yeah, he yeah. He only good for They sports. think he's, yes. Yes. He got to be a hell of a guy in sports. Yes. Or they gonna say he's or dangerous. He's done. He's, he's, he's done. He's, yeah, if you he's can't catch this ball or shoot that shot, you're useless here. Wow. And that's and that's why so many children go into sports, the black boys. It ain't because they necessarily want to be an athlete. This is the only way I'm going to survive or get recognized here because I'm clearly not wanted because of the way and, I'm and from the parents. A lot yes. of times. The sport thing drives the parent closer to you because yeah. it's like they're living through you in some yep. weird way yep. where they yep. want you to play. And you ain't saw your daddy. Your daddy yep. don't clock in about none. And I just spoke to a mother the other day who told me her son is only in sports. And he's good, but he don't even like sports. This is the other day. My son is only in sports, Dr. Umar, because his father only pays attention to him through sports. You see that? So the father only showing up if it's a football game, that's basketball. This is, it's yeah. the only way he can get his father's attention. And that's so a lot part. of black boys are going into sports because their father likes sports, and this is the only way they can hook their Right, and, and I wonder why, I mean, why do you think black men do that? Like, they live vicariously through their children in that way, like in the, in the, in the pathway, not just... Like, I look, you look like me, Junior. Right. Like, they actually say, no, go do what I couldn't do. Yeah. Like, what is Some that Some of about? it is natural. It's natural, right? I own a business. I want my son to own one. It's natural. But, but if my business... It can become pathological. Right, but my bit... Before you go, because I get, know you're going to smoke that. Mm. But my business, for it to even make it that far to be passed to my son, had to be successful. So right. passing down right. something successful is one thing. Right. But to pass right. down my failure... Yeah, yeah. You know what and, I'm saying? And if you don't redeem me, Ooh. the child feels twice as bad because not only did I fail on the football field, my daddy needed me to win in order to salvage his self-esteem. So now the child feels twice as low because not only did I fail, my daddy needed me to win this so he could validate himself. Man, and, and they put so much in And that leads to the marijuana smoking, mm. the blunts. You see that? Mm. I let my daddy, even though my daddy might be saying, son, don't worry about it. You gave it your best. I, I know, know you needed this yeah. Now I'm feeling less than. Wow. Now we both feel like we ain't the, 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 the females, the women don't go through that, do they? Do they have a version of that? Like They have a version, but it's not as strong because the ego The mother the model, maybe the mo model mother, maybe the dancing mother. I've seen the dancing mother like where... It, it's, it's there, but it's there. It's not as strong because yeah, the that ego of the male, strong. the male ego stronger than the female, right? Mm. But here's where it gets interesting with our sisters. It's kind of the opposite sometimes. 
where the father needs the son to succeed because he didn't. The mother wants the daughter to fail because she didn't win. Mm. So, so stay have, like me. Stay like me. Mm. So I see a situation where the mothers are sabotaging the daughters mm. on purpose. They love them. They want them to do well. But they're having a difficult time accepting the fact that when this is all said and done, she would have exceeded me. Yeah. And, and, that, so we, and I think that's powerful. Oh, we got that's a deep, powerful. We got a deep seated yeah, mommy daughter. That's powerful. A deep, a deep seated mommy we daughter. We cooking Christ. now, Uma. We cook. You got a deep seated mommy daughter. And I tell you one of the worst ones. Let's go back to the light skin supremacy. When the mother is of a lighter hue and she values European standards of beauty. So she got the fine nose, the fine lips, the yellow skin, the, uh, the, the, the wavy hair. But the daughter has very strong African-centered features. And she knows that the mother believes beauty is in the way she looks. So by contraindication, I'm ugly. And then the mother never does anything. These is nonverbal. I need non people to catch that. Nonverbal. That's just, by just, indication. Just through the, it, the example, the Ooh, energy. Yes. By the standard that's put She here. going out with her mom and her mom is all european up. That's Big it. nose, brawless, beautiful sister. Yeah. But she can't see her beauty. Right. Because she's judging herself by her mother's standards, which are European. Right, right. Continue. I'm sorry about you that. See, yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of girls' self-esteem get destroyed by their mother never validating their African-centered traits. Mm. And then the mother I've seen, and again, we, we, we're not being critical, we're examining. Yes, because these are major issues. In yeah, the, and, and we, we have to speak about these. Yes. So, so when we did, I've seen, because cosmetic surgery is big, and we're going to speak about that, but I've seen where the mother sometimes, because we dealt with the man side, so I'm just trying to figure out where the women, where, if they're battling this and where it lies at, but I have seen where the mother would take herself through uh, a round or two of cosmetic surgery mm. and by indicators that wears on the child as well. Oh my gosh. You know, yes. the child said, oh, mama thick. Yes. And so I ain't thick. I must not be, you know, kicking as high as she is or being, you know, as beautiful as she if is. If the mother is going to get surgery of any kind, whether it's the BBL, whether it's facial reconstruction, whatever it is, breasts, she got to have a conversation with her daughters about why. Because if she don't, the daughters are automatically going to assume. Get in line. Get in line. You were not comfortable with yourself. I'm your daughter. I looked exactly how you looked before you underwent. Because you don't even look like me no more. You when you go like get me. all that work and come back home, man, we used to look just alike. Which means what? It is a rejection. It is a rejection of your phenotype. And in rejecting your phenotype, you reject your children. Mm. Oh, is that Now, I, I do want to be clear to you, though. Go ahead. I, I can appreciate the BBL now. I can't. And I'm going to tell you why. It don't bounce. Nah, you talking about the cheap one. See, it's, you talking about the cheap BBL, Dr. Umar. And how you know it don't bounce, first of all? How the hell you know it don't bounce? I'm King, King Kong, Kong conscious? I'm King Kong. <laughs> but listen. <laughs> Ladies, listen to me, sisters. Please don't do it. It looks good. Hold on now. We got it a certain. Oh, whoa, whoa. It, it, no, no. It we got two good. different. No. It look good in the clothes. And it might even look good out of the clothes. But it does not move organically. A man can tell the difference. A man can tell the difference whether you fake in the front or fake in the back. We can tell the difference because the bounce ain't the same. Hey, it listen. bounces at all. It's the quality of the BBL you experience. So Don't we're, we're dealing it. with a guy. Stay natural. We're dealing with a guy who has experienced a horrible BBL. So <laughs> y'all are getting the side of the story that's not accurate. I'm explaining to you. Don't that, do it, ladies. Listen, and and so I don't know where you pulled this one from, but uh -huh. I would say get, get your get, get another shot at that, Umar. You're wrong about that. I'm all natural. You're all, all natural. Na now. So oh, I have saw you with Suki though. <laughs> Right? So shout out to my sister Suki. Shout out, shout out to Suki, Sexy huh? Red. We gonna talk to all y'all. Talk yes. about all y'all. Yeah. I saw you with Suki on. Yeah, sister Suki and I, we're, we're friends. Mm. Uh, we conversate yeah. on different topics. See, here's my thing. Here's my thing. 
as conscious as we are, we can't be so self-righteous that we can't go to where someone else is and try to move them from where they are to where we need them to be. I'm not the pastor who condemns everyone in the neighborhood and never get them to join the church. You see that? You have to meet them. She's a very influential woman. Yes. If one day she decided to come on over to the consciousness movement, everybody who follows her comes right on with her. And that's the day that I'm looking at. You see what I'm saying? So me, I communicate with anybody. And that's one of the strengths of Dr. Umar. They're not going to feel condemned, right? I'll get a brother with a white wife. He'll come over, Doc, I know you see what I got. <laughs> he said it like it's a bad sandwich or something. You know what I mean? No, you see what I ordered, bro. No, they, they say, you know, but, you know, can we still have, of course, have a seat, my brother. Because guess what? If I cut him off, he'll never go back to a sister. But if I stay with him, I don't even have to talk about his white wife because I'm not going to disrespect her. She's still a human being. But by allowing him in my space, he's going to start reanalyzing that anyway. And then one day he comes back with a beautiful black queen. Doc, I, had, I couldn't do it no more. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So I've noticed in my work through the years, just exposing people to what's right can lead to a change in behavior. I remember back in my Garvey days, right? And of course, I'm still a Garveyite. But back in North Philadelphia, we got Temple University down the street, University of Pennsylvania, Drexel. And the students would come to the Garvey meeting, and they would say, Marcus Garvey said, race first, put the race first. I can't do that. I love everybody. I said, it's not about not loving other people. It's about loving yourself first. Well, I can't do that. No problem. Just come to the study group. I didn't pressure them kids. And guess what? They slowly, one by one, started joining on their own. Just walk, I'm ready to sign up. I didn't do nothing. Just expose them to the truth. You see what I'm saying? So that's why I will meet with anybody. I will go anywhere. Just like Christ said in the Bible. I'm not comparing myself to Christ. But when they say, you know, Master, would you go into the house of a thief? And I, he say, I go anywhere where I'm invited. That's how Dr. Umar is. I go anywhere I'm invited because I know that when you are presented with the truth, your soul responds to it. And sooner or later, sooner or later, you're going to have to come around as well because we as African people, we are God's chosen people. And therefore, we are structured to to uh, participate in righteousness no matter what. You see what I'm saying? So when somebody holds up that mirror of righteousness to you, sooner or later you're going to have to consider it because that's your nature anyway. You know what? And you know, I, I think, like I say, man, you, you, you're great at this. You're definitely great at this. But we didn't get an answer about Suki. We talked about a lot. <laughs> you took me around the I corner. I told you, we, we, we friends. We right, talked. Right, right. But, but, okay, so... Because, see, we're coming off the BBL conversation. Right. We're coming off how you are not interested in BBL whatsoever. And I don't know if the sister has. Well, I've never I seen her that way. We're ex- tonics. Right, right. But, but again, I'm telling you that the circumstances are the circumstances, mm-hmm. unknown or known. Mm-hmm. Right. And so by you being someone who is that strong about BBLs, right, I asked you about Suki, and I'm just telling you right, how, right. how we kind of uh-huh, got to uh-huh. her anyway, because I don't want it to seem like it's just. Yeah. I never asked, right. and I wouldn't. Right, okay, okay. I don't okay. think it's my place. Right, yeah. now, but you've heard some of the things she's said about you, right? <laughs> yes. All right, so meeting someone with a BBL that said some of those things about you, meaning that she finds you attractive, uh, she, you know, certain things that she. So I'm saying the meetup, I mean, help me understand what's going on now. The meetups are professional and platonic. With a, with a woman that calls you attractive, with a BBL. <laughs> professional and platonic. Okay, shut up. I'll leave it at that. Shut out to Suki. Shut out to with, Suki. With, with, do you know Sexy Red? Familiar with Sexy Red? I've seen her recently. I never heard of her before. Ha, you familiar with her content? I've heard the kind of, I, 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 I've never heard her rap though. I haven't seen a video. That's some of the kind, and I got her coming on soon, so I don't want to, okay. you know, right, right, right. slander her at all. But, you know, it's just, I was having that conversation about, about female rap and, and how, um, in my opinion, they're kind of mimicking what they saw the men do in gangster rap. I agree with you. I don't think that they necessarily created this path. Oftentimes I see them, uh, promote a lifestyle that they don't even adopt. Yes. And it's dangerous, but it's dangerous the same way the men done it. And I so agree. I believe the men really led those I women agree. into creating that kind of content. I, I totally agree with you. But the men were never held accountable for it. 
Right. The women are being held. It's the double standard. Right. And the women, again, sometimes they get with these guys, right? And it's like, and this is why I try to give grace on the content, but I know it's effective in regards to it's programming minds. I know that, but I try to sometimes, because I always try to think, put myself in someone's shoes like I did with Dion. It's like, yo, see out of their lens, right? See out of a young girl like Sexy Red with two kids, two baby daddies, they both in jail, and I know how to rap. And I start rapping like this, and it start going. Do I turn that off when I have nothing to fall back on? Like, how many people will actually, at 24 years old, Start getting 100000 a show, 60000 a show, and just turn that off. Even if I know I'm not necessarily adopting that lifestyle, but it's effective for the family. And I think so many of us live in that place. You do. We all, that's why I try to give grace, mm -hmm. right? I don't exempt anyone, mm -hmm. but I try to understand the route they're taking. That's why when I look at a Dion, it's like, ah, not a finished product. I think that we're on a journey and Colorado is just on that list of getting where I'm going. And the same with Sexy Red, it's like you get in that position, turn this on and it works. Mm -hmm. I got children. What do I do? What do you what what would you say to a young girl that's rapping that kind of content? How does she get out of that? I don't think my message would be to the young girl rapping the content. I think my message would be to the black community that gave rise to the circumstances that put her in a position where she had to sing that content. I think one of the things we often miss when we talk about accountability, responsibility, is that we fail to recognize that everything we do takes place within a culture. It takes place within a community. And too often, because we are a disorganized, selfish group of people, we like to make individuals the scapegoat for systemic problems. You see that? whether it's Sexy Red, whether it's Sister Suki Hana, whether it's the gangster rapper, everything takes place within a cultural context, right? So what, what, what situation was she born in? What situation were her parents born in? What did the black church do for her mother? What did the black politicians do for her mother? What did the black community organizers do for her mother? What can they do? Well, number one, if it wasn't for the economic desperation, a lot of our young people will be making better decisions. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's the point I'm making. Yeah. It's like, yo, this thing working. Yeah. And, 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 and she should have never had to go there. The reason she had to go there is she belongs to a community, the black community, that does not feel the need to use its disposable income to create financial opportunities for its young people. Go to the streets right now. Our young people are terrorizing our community and it's our fault because we have not created any opportunities for them. You let me go to a school that miseducate me. I get special educated. I get medicated. I get juvenile adjudicated. I get incarcerated. Right. I get gang initiated. Right. I get raped. I get molested. I got put out on the street by my mom, whatever the case may be. And now all that pain that the community allowed me to feel, I'm going to give it back to the community. And now you got 11 year olds robbing 84 year olds at the ATM. That video that came out last week, it made me want to cry. He looked like he was nine years old robbing someone old enough to be his great grandmother. But when we allow our children to be raised by social media, when we allow yeah, our children to be raised by the television and not raising them ourselves. I mean, think about it. If you're a black child in Nashville, you're a black child in Chattanooga, you're a black child in Knoxville, Memphis. Where can you go if you really need an adult to spend some time with you? There's nowhere to go. You can go to church, but you got to swallow their doctrine before they value you first. Y'all see how that works? You're not important in this church until you swallow this doctrine. So where can a black child go in America if they need an adult to spend some time with them? You see that? But the pimp will spend some time with me. The drug dealer spend some time with me. They're going to use me and exploit me, but they're going to spend some time with me. We have turned our backs on our children. We have not raised them. We have not nurtured them. And now the black community is collecting the karmic debt that has come from our neglect of our children. Is, is Schools and jobs. Build our own schools for our children and create jobs for them. If we never do those two things, we never get our young people back. Is your school going to be credited in, in the state? Yes. Well, remember now, accreditation is voluntary. State law gives you the right to operate. So the state approves you to operate. If you want to get accredited, 
that's voluntary. The credited process speaks, doesn't that, isn't that what speaks to the workforce? No, not necessarily. Okay. Because you got to remember, you got children who are homeschooled to college. They've never been to a school at all. You see what I'm saying? A credit- Even in college? You can homeschool college? No, no, no. Homeschooled into college. In other words, my child is a Same difference. Harvard. Okay, I see what see you're what saying. saying? So you plug in the FDMG instead of the homeschool and it'll be like the same process. Absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. Except we're a real school versus a right, homeschool. Right, right, right. Homeschool is a decentralized form of education. It's not the equivalent of private school, charter school, public school. You see, it's homeschooling. It's more of an activity than an institution, you see. Mm. But it, accreditation is voluntary. So if I wanted to go to a Delaware State Accredita- Accreditation Bureau, I could have them come in, look at all our paperwork, curriculum, teaching, boom, 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 and they would decide if they want to accredit us or not. Now, for me as a Pan-Africanist, I would never do that because I don't need white people to tell me how to teach black kids. So I'll never be doing that, right? If the state required it, we would do it. You feel me? But I would not voluntarily go to white people and ask them, how well am I doing teaching black kids? How much of your money from fundraising do you, do you think came from white people? Any? Zero. Zero dollars. Yeah, there might have been a couple anonymous, anonymous white folks yeah. who sent a dollar or two, probably, right? But am I aware, am I consciously aware of receiving a, a, a donation from a white person? No. So, ooh, this is good. So, a white person can't give you $5 million, say, Dr. Umar, I've been a fan of you since 2012. I see what you got going on. Go get that school done, brother. White man. I I'm talking about white as other white. I don't, I don't think I could take it. Okay, so the mission ain't that important then. No, it is. How, okay, how important is the mission when you can't take the money? None, I didn't speak to any stipulations tied to it. I said this will get your school up and running tomorrow, and, and you denied it. And the mistake you just made is you said a white person is going to give Dr. Umar $5 million with no stipulations. Yeah. Wh- Who in this auditorium believes that? No, listen. I'm t- how is that worth clapping? White people don't give that kind of money without no stipulations, brother. They don't give that kind of money. Omar, give Giddy, honestly, let's talk about that. But was that worth clapping about? Yes. All you said was, no, look. Yes. All you, you said, you look, and I like this going to play well on YouTube. But all you said was, all you said was, what the hell did you say? It didn't even stick. What did no, you listen, say? Listen, listen. Here's the part. What did you just say? You're missing. That's what it was. You're missing. Yeah, okay, so listen. Well, I'm telling spirit. you. You're missing the spirit. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. White man give me five million. Right? I build the school with five million. Y'all come to the grand opening. Y'all going to be happy. Y'all going to celebrate. But when you go home in the back of your mind, you're still saying. White people did this for us again. Do you understand? Ain't nobody saying that. No, yes. Yes. These people yes. lying. It speaks. It speaks Deep. to the spirit. Cause you ain't nobody, know. even if it speaks to the spirit. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hear me out, good brother. It speaks to the spirit. You know why? 90% of all black institutions are financed or owned by white people. People don't even know that. Yes, we do. <laughs> most yes, we people do. don't. Most people. This crowd may because okay. this is a college gotcha. HBCU type. Yes, most people don't even think of it like that right so what i'm saying is if the mission is more important than you how you feel how you think what i my emotions Uh then why isn't this money even if they kill me about it even if they but the school get to go get up and running i just don't understand that have you ever heard the statement the journey is just as important as the destination yeah how we get the school done is just as important as getting the school done. Let me ask you a question. How do I open up a school called Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy? Two black men who believed in self-determination, but I let a white man build the school for me. How do I tell the boys that you can do this on your own? You don't need white people. You don't need nobody but your own community. How can I say that? Do you truly believe that? Absolutely. Do you think that, that do you truly believe that it, it'll happen off the backs of only us? It already has. 
It's not open yet, so it well, hasn't happened. Yeah, well, it will be once we get the certificate of occupancy, but right. it already has. Yeah. So I'm saying, but so so you you've done this. You so this got to be the first school without white involvement. Definitely in a hundred years since Marcus Garvey, and probably the first ever that was financed exclusively by the African diaspora. Every black community on earth donated to FDMJ. When did you when did you globalize your your your, your movement? Because it wasn't that way at first. No, I was always Pan-African, so it was always global. You, it, just, it just took a while for my message to get around to the continent. I feel like you started at some point going super Pan-African. Like, I thought you no, was, was always conscious. From the gate. No, Yo, no, no, I'm saying I ain't, I ain't speaking about in your spirit. I'm speaking about in your communication. No, the message was always Pan-African. It was always, always so even on those DVDs. Yes. Now, every time I see you talk, I hear Pan-African. Now, always from the beginning. okay, so I must have yeah, missed that. Yeah, it seemed well, like I they started to evolve. Nah, into, nah, it, it, it been Pan African. This is something I've always wanted to ask you. Mm-hmm. Where do you get this from? And I'm gonna do a quick Dr. Umar impression. Yeah. All right, <laughs> and I want you to tell me where you got this from. Um, so you'll be on live, right? Say Dr. Umar's on live, and you'll be like, uh, "Good morning, brothers and sisters. You know, today we will make sure that we get." Everything we need to get done. Good morning today, brothers and sisters. Good morning today, brothers and sisters. Good morning today, brothers. You'll give them four or five of them, three of them. Okay, what is that? Is that you thinking? Is that you? What is that? I do that. Because I've, I've adopted that. Uh, I want you yeah, to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah effective. Yeah. It's effective. The brain is the creature of repetition. Yes. Not truth. Repetition. Yes. Right. Program. So I say it three times. The, the, the points I really want them to get, I repeat it three times because repetition is how you condition the unconscious. So once to understand, a second time to understand, and the third time to overstand. I knew it was a, I knew that wasn't you yeah. stumbling. I knew it was something there. Yeah. Because I'm like, yeah. yo, he just, re- nah, I know him. And we speak and we don't really yeah. have to. So I'm saying when you do that, I say, oh, it's technique. There's something yeah. there. Yeah. Who did you study in regards to speaking? Because speaking is such a talent that people don't really understand. They don't even know how hard this is for us to just be doing yeah. this. Uh, Who did you study? I never really studied anyone. I guess indirectly, Garvey and Douglas would be the main two, obviously. Uh, but most of our leaders were great orators, you know, so... I've listened to all of them, but I never patterned myself after anyone or, or, or anything like that. You know what I mean? It just came natural. You took from nothing from any. You you nah. took technique. You ain't took no technique from no one. If there was any technique. Because, see, I, you, got the, you got the pointing. You got, you, bro, I'm high me. level. That's, Listen, I'm, this is how I make money. So I'm high level examining speakers, right? right the right. pointing, the right. everything. I'm watching it all. So I'm saying, this is a developed thing. This isn't. Uh-huh something you can walk off the porch with. So I wonder, I I think some of us are born with it though. I I, I think some of us are born with it. I think think the great ones like Garvey, Douglas, Dr. King, you can't teach that. You can nurture it, I ain't saying teach it. it. And that's what I mean, like you can't teach it. I'm not saying teach it. Right. Because teaching will speak. But you can teach people how to speak though. Yes, but not on this level. Right, right, So I'm saying, when I'm I'm peeping what you're doing, Understand I've already identified that I'm trying, I'm watching the best speakers in the world because mm-hmm. this is how I make yes, my sir. money, right? So I ain't even talking about the rest of those guys. I'm saying the highest level of communication, mm-hmm. right? You, the, the Farrakhans, the people that I look at and say, oh, all right, I, let's let, let, pull a notepad out, get some of that technique because there's, there's breath control, there's pausing, there's repeating, there's, mm-hmm. there's face... You know, there's so much that's happening. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering who deposited the, the, anything. The, the, the only technique that I'm conscious of having borrowed from my predecessors is the need to pause yes. occasionally. Yes. Because y'all so know when I get important. In, I'll just go. Yeah. And I won't stop. So I consciously try to yes. remember to pause. Yes. And that's probably more of a Frederick Douglass thing yes. than anything else. Because people have to take it in. They even with me, up. like, see, because even with me, when you try to get into that vibe, yeah. you know, it's like, all right, at some point, I got to start talking to you like you listening. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. some people, they just talking. You got to talk to somebody like they're listening. Yes. You know, yes. and sometimes yes. when I need emphasis on something, I need to lay there for that. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, even in our communication today, today, you would say something like, 
uh, for your black liberation and you'll just let that live. Mm -hmm. And I think those techniques, I just want you to know that people are watching those things and you're, you're pouring into people indirectly just by... You, you, you know, spiritually, right, there's about five different major spiritual gifts. You have your clear cognizance. That's when information from the universe is downloaded automatically into your mind. You know it, but you don't know where you learned it. That's clear cognizance. When I speak, not all the time, but sometimes, clear cognizance will take over. And I'm saying things about things I've never learned nowhere. So it's coming directly from the ancestors. And I'll go back and look at a clip and say, how did I say that? And I didn't even know that. Yeah. So there's sometimes you get into a zone yeah. where it's not even you. Oh, man, I love those zones. You, you follow, that's oh, the man, them zones there. When yeah. I, if I can get in a pocket on yeah. these boys, yeah. it's nothing like it. That's man. what I'm saying. It's not all the time. You no, know when it's coming. and it's magic. And yeah. you feel it as a speaker, as yeah. someone. Yeah. You say, and you know when you win. Yeah, I got in my bag. Like, I'm not now. stopping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, take yeah. a break. We ain't taking no break. No, we can't. The ancestors yeah, are yeah, speaking. Yeah, We're going to yeah, keep yeah, doing Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the one thing I learned about public speaking, Public speaking taught me more than anything else. We have no control over the outcome. Because I walk into a certain lecture, I'm like, oh, I'm going to tear this up tonight. It's the right sound, right building, right this. And it'll be a regular lecture. And then I'll go somewhere where I'm like, okay, this is just going to be a regular little talk. It's my classics. All of my classics were unintentional. Mm. Every one. Mm. The ones that people love, I'm like, damn. I never even thought that night was going to yeah. be that special. And it's never up to us. Yeah, and this is important for the young content creators because they're watching us. But here's the thing, too. Um, as I'm going further and further, I just did Invest Fest for 20,000 people, right? And so when you come out and it's, and it's that many people, you look around like, what is this, right? And it's like you blow a circuit or you blow a fuse. You get it back, but for a brief second, it's almost like, what? Like, zoom. Yeah. It's like everything yeah. you was thinking, your thought process, but it eventually comes, it, it eventually comes back. Do you find yourself um, ever being in that mode? Because you speak so much now, I don't think you, you, may, you may find yourself well, in for that. For me, the best speech is the first time they saw you because there's no expectations. You feel me? If I'm going, like, uh, I'm going to Cameroon, Africa next week, right? I was in Brussels, Belgium last week. I've never been to Brussels. So there's no pressure because I know they know me from social media, but they never felt me in the person. Right. This is no pressure. Right. You know what the pressure is? When I've been in Nashville 10 times and y'all came back to see me that 11th, that's pressure because y'all know what to expect. Y'all seen it. And I got to give y'all a new fresh message and be even more dynamic. I was the previous nine times. Yeah. So some people would say the more you come back to a city, the easier. Not for me. It's the harder. Yeah. You feel me? Like a place like Chicago where yeah. I spend a lot, New York where I spend a lot, it's pressure. Yeah. Because not only do I got to have a new message, I got to grab you every time better than I did the last time. And, and what I'm trying to do, right, because I'm ascending so fast. So I'm trying to figure out when now I'm conscious about this as, as I'm getting because it's so much money on the line. And anybody watching me, I got millions of people watch. I need y'all to know this. Pay attention to whatever you're doing. Right now, man, I'm finding myself trying to understand when I get those zones, I literally try to backtrack what that day was. Like, did uh, I place myself there? Was it something I done before the show? Was it, nah. even though I know it's probably not because it never yeah. reenacts itself. Yeah. But it's like I'm conscious on trying to grab that or create that environment mm -hmm. that puts me. Have you found anything like that for you that something that puts you into a place where, like me, I went back the other day, and, and I'm give you a second. Before you came, I'm like, I'm trying to fish. What, what is that that gets my brain? Because like, sometimes, dude, my brain will go, and it's like I'm on another. Yeah. It's another yeah. frequency. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I wanted to yeah. ask you. you know, I believe when you get to a certain level within your spiritual development, myself included, You'll be able to activate it at will. Mm. The reason we can't activate it at will yet, we not at that frequency yeah. yet. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. 
when you get to that frequency, you'll be able to activate it at will. That zone. Yes. It's the athlete, too, where they shoot a shot and can't miss. Right. right for five minutes, yeah. I can't miss. Yeah, I'm on. They in that zone. Yes. You went to a high, you went into your super conscious mind. Yes. Right? But we have to get there through the spiritual. The is spiritual. there anything that gets you there? Like, I've seen you. Is there anybody that maybe they argue with you and they play? Who is it? He think he, or they insult your intelligence, or they. Not because it's all based on divine timing. It is. Right. So, from an African perspective, we exist in two worlds we exist in the physical and we exist in the spiritual at the same time. We can't see what's happening in the spiritual. It could have been within the spiritual design for this day. For you to access right. your God consciousness right. for that. You follow right. what I'm saying? Right. right. Because right. remember, we got our own plans. Our ancestors got a plan too. Right. And then God got a plan too. Right. So we think that when we wake up, we're just living our life as we want. No. Your ancestors got a hand in it because you are a reincarnation of them. And then the most high, the universe has a design of its own. And this is why when you hear like Dr. King say, I want to do God's will, you got to tap into that. You got to tap into that. The highest form of expression is when what you want is the exact same thing God wants you to have. That's divine consciousness, and that's the purpose of life. And that's why I think that we as black people never get to where we're supposed to be, brothers and sisters, until we divorce ourselves from all of this European materialism that we swallowed up because we have become more materialistic than the Caucasian. We are literally worshiping money. And there's no, why would God Help us get free. Really help us take back over the world as we once ran it. If all we're going to do is replicate European culture. Does that make any sense to you? God is not going to help you. Why would he get rid of the white man so the black man can replicate the white man? You have to go back to being who you are. And when you go back to being who you are, that's when supreme consciousness will come and say, okay, my children, you ready. Let me put you back on the throne. We do not go back on the throne. We do not until we recover our African minds. I seen you going viral. Uh, you had an argument with a couple of guys, and shout out to them, I don't, I don't know their name. Delhi Rapper arguing. Crew, the Young Brothers? Yeah, kind of a debate. Shout out to the Delhi Rapper yeah, Crew, good, they, good they, Young they, Brothers yeah, too. Yeah, shout out to brothers. those guys. I think they was up in New York or something, right? New York. Yeah, shout out to WTMF Studios as well, they're my people. Um, but that discussion was about the black woman being framed as masculine, yes. as um, unsupportive in yes. a lot of ways, and just a, a number of different things. And choosing the wrong mate. Choosing the wrong mate. And, and, and those brothers feeling like, why do I have to settle for a woman who had a child by a man who was less than his best? Right. And my argument was real simple. If we as black men were on our job, meaning we're taking responsibility for the development of all the black boys in Nashville, then that young lady could never choose a wrong mate because we would never allow a wrong mate to exist. So whenever a black man says, it ain't my fault she got a baby by Pookie, Pookie shouldn't even exist. Because you don't put that on the same white people that we put the rest of this stuff on? So, uh huh? The same white people that we put all the systematic shit on. Uh -huh. We don't put that on them? Let me tell you why. They might have created it, but they're not solving none of your problems. We have to solve our own problems. And like I told those young brothers, black women would give us so much respect if we only did one thing, take control of the boys. If we just did that, if we just went around to all the sisters who ain't got a man in the house, how many sons you got? You got two. How many you got? I got one. How many you got? I got five boys. We got them. We got them. We going to the school meetings. We going to be with them after school. We checking the homework. We doing rites of passage. We taking them gun training, camping. We got them. If we just took the boys, our sisters be all right with us. And that's and that, that's in a perfect world. I agree with that. But, but why the world got to be perfect for us to do that? Because again, the black man is under attack, right? But that the, don't stop me from helping the youngin. Well, it do we if you, it do if you can't so multitask. See, everybody ain't got we the kind of... multitask when we be chasing that ass. Yeah, but that's, that kind of multitask is self-satisfying, right? That's a self, selfish, self-satisfying yeah. multitask, so that's a bit different. You're asking people to multitask and give, not get. Right. So it's a different circumstance. I, I see what you said. Right. When we're when we telling someone that's under attack to, hey, not only think about yourself, think about that other individual over there that ain't yours, that ain't got nothing. And I'm with you on the... 
in the overall, the overarching goal, but I want to deal with the reality of it. And there's a quote that says, don't wish things to be how you want them to be. Wish them to be how they are, because that's the reality you live in. Things will be what they are, no matter what. You can't change that, Umar. You can... We can do all. You can't change it. It is what it is, bro. We can't look at it for what Question we want it to you. be. Question for you. Go ahead. Here's what I think, and, and I agree with mostly what you said there. Here's, here's what I think. I think we as black men, and I'm talking to all the brothers in here, although not all of you are guilty of what I'm going to say, but I'm speaking to us as a brotherhood. I believe we have gotten so comfortable scapegoating white supremacy that we don't want to take responsibility for anything in the community ourselves. Are y'all following me? That's, that's where we at Somebody, as men. Somebody, yeah. That, 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 that's, that, that's where we at as men. It's like we don't want no responsibility. It's either the black woman's fault or it's the power structure's fault. What the hell are we going to do? I didn't because, say black woman. No, no, I'm not saying you. Yeah, I'm, I won't, saying, I'm talking about for my audience. Right, 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 right. right, right. But yeah. I'm saying in the general conversation, the narrative, either the black woman is the f problem or the white power structure. That's most of your conversation. No, sir. Not the black woman, but definitely the white power structure. Cause the problems. But the solution is ours to make. Okay, so okay. We got let's, to let's, not, let's not push these together. No, they go together. Right, the but let's deal with them separately. Okay. So we can have a, 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 a clear understanding of what. Because okay. when you mash them up, I don't know which one we're talking I got you. about. I got you. Right? I got you. Problem. The problem is... The power structure. Yes, sir. The solution lies in our hands. Period. But that the power structure is still attacking the black male, yes or no? That's true. Okay, so again, if you don't have the ability to multitask, when do you expect the black male to be self-preservation? Self but who said again? we can't multitask? Everybody can't, Dr. Umar. We can't say everybody can save children. Shopping. We find time to party. Saving children is different than the partying. We find time to go on vacation. That's an excuse. We don't care enough to do it, and we need to be honest and say that. You think the same skill set it takes for me to go stand in the club is the same skill set it takes for me to help no, a no, child. No, 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 no. It's a different skill yeah, set. Yeah. That, I'm speaking a skill set. Right. You're talking intention. Right. I'm saying people don't even have the skill set to raise their own children. You asking them to help other children when they can't even raise, they ain't even got the know-how to handle their own household. Okay. That means those of us who know how, show them brothers how. We operate as a brotherhood. So that's a all different I'm conversation. Saying, Instead we, of we, casting that wide net and saying that all black men, you, you niggas, excuse me, <laughs> you guys, you guys, they put, you guys didn't put the work in to make an environment to where these people can. So I'm saying when we take that approach, we don't live in what I would consider to be reality and say that, yo, everybody can't multitask. But here's and my even, pushback then. Go ahead. Then we need to stop telling our women to respect us as men. We need to stop telling our women to, ex to stop expecting us to behave as men. If we're going to say can't, because can't should not be in a man's vocabulary and definitely not in our collective consciousness. If can you open a school tomorrow? <laughs> no, but I can in a month. Okay, I get what you say. So, you but saying? that's still hoping. Hope ain't a strategy. It ain't hope. No, we're not hoping to open a school. We're waiting on a certificate of occupancy. You're not giving me a deadline on this on this big broadcast saying in a month this school will be open. Physically, yes. All okay, we need, all okay, we're waiting okay. for is the certificate. But it won't be. Won't I be. don't know how long the city gonna take to give me that paper. That's the next step. You see. See. Okay. So then. Right. But but it's not a hope. It's just a matter of time. They gotta give us the paper because all the renovations are done. Everything's inspected and approved. You see what I'm saying? So it's not a hope, it's just when. When are they going to give right, us the paper? Right. They can't hold off forever, then we got to get the lawyers involved. You see what I'm saying? Right. But I just think that we as men are not recognizing. For you to say, that's a bold statement, bro. Like, what? as a man, you can't have can't in your vocabulary. We should not when it comes to saving our boys, we should. Now, that's a different. See, you, this is how good You're you are. We're talking about our boys. Yeah, but this is how good you are. You cast a wide there to say, can't as a man they shouldn't even respect us as a man if we saying can't and it's in our vocabulary as it pertains to our boys as that's a different to our boys. Okay, okay and as it pertains to almost anything a man should be expected to do for his community see i can't i, I gotta live in a space where i know everybody can't be everything then let us then we gotta stop telling women to see us as kings then we can't have it both ways 
You can't say respect me as the God of the community. And then on the flip side, I can't do nothing about that shit. <laughs> and you can't do that. You can't have it both ways. We as men got to make up our mind. Yeah, I, get, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm trying to take it in. It's just for me, again, I, I, I just, I don't know. And when know. you say multitask, it bothers me because black women have been multitasking <laughs> for yeah, 75 but, years. Yeah, and, and that, that's 100 <laughs> Raising the kids, paying the bills. What they got to do with black men? Open a business. Huh? What, what does the ability for a black woman to be superior in that way, right? Okay. To be able to multitask in that way uh -huh. have to do with black men. Why we don't share we all do of the same. same. We don't share all of the same. No, two hum we don't share all of the same attributes. Oh. I'm not saying that men, black men in general can't do it. I'm saying when we say black men as a whole is responsible for the environment, because, the, because all black men can't, I, I think that's what the problem is. So then here's my question for you. Mm -hmm. If black men can't be expected to be responsible for the development, the nurture, and the growth of black boys, what in the hell can we be entrusted Other with? Other black boys. I'm, not, I'm saying that most black men, at least that I know, especially coming from the, we just see, this is what I'm saying, right. actively listening, right? We just were speaking about how sexy red and all of these people <laughs> are in circumstances in which the first priority is saving their family. Even at the detriment, right. you just said, you feel me, even at the detriment of the community, okay. right? We just spoke about, and I want to take Sexy Red out of it because it ain't about her, but we right. just spoke about female rap and them promoting a lifestyle that they may not even adopt and, and how that's detrimental. Right. But because self-preservation is kicked in, somehow that ain't, that ain't their fault by rapping that. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. If black men were being the men that our community need, would there be a Suki Hana or a Sexy Red? No. Why not? They wouldn't exist. Let's elaborate before we... Why, why not? the circumstances that gave rise to those two beautiful black women having to engage in the art form that they are in in order to take care of themselves and their children, those circumstances that gave birth to this reality would have never been allowed to fester. Men control the structure and the set boundaries. We don't do that. And if we're going to say we can at least be responsible for the boys, if we're going to tell black women that we can't do nothing with our boys, what else should she be willing to trust us with? Do you push that off on, what about the boy's father? Okay, you, you, you push it to the that. community, right? First what about all, his father? Okay, that's not our culture. Our culture is collectivism. If you're not there, I got to be. It's that simple. The reasons don't even matter. He ain't there. I got to take his place. I am because we are. We are because I am. See, we like the scapegoat individuals because we don't want no collective accountability. How many kids have you personally, and I don't mean over the phone. Wow. How many? Too many to count. A, a lot of them. Too many to count. Do Man you think, do you think you've touched more children than Dion? Sanders? I think it's very possible that I have. And I'm going strictly off of the feedback I get from young men, right? Through the will of God, because I give the grace to the Lord. Right. I get messages that sometimes make me cry from young men. You're the reason I didn't take my life. You're the reason I didn't leave my family. You're the reason I finished college. You're the reason I came back home. Sometimes I get these testimonies from these brothers, man. I feel like they're making it up because there's no way you're telling me I influenced your life that much. You see what I'm saying? And these are the ones who I've never even direct, but then you have the ones who I've directly mentored, spent time with, and assisted. You see what I'm saying? And that's why when we go back to the money thing with the whole podcast piece, and I need to look into that because I need that money to build more schools. That's what I'm saying. That's why I have to do it for more and schools. And this is why I say if the mission, the mission is, it's a lot of money even being left out there. That's yes, just sir. left on that the ground. Yes, for the mission. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. But I was just going to say, that's one of the reasons why the money never really factored mightily into my vision because I get paid back so much through the spirit for what I give to the people. And see that, that sometimes that blinds you or distracts me 
from, from even looking at the yeah, X's yeah, and the yeah, O's. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's like, damn, if I'm able to do that, I could give a damn about the money. You see what I'm saying? And see, but we need the money yeah. for the mission. And also, but see, that's still, that's, that's you fueling the motivation. That's what I'm saying. The, it, the motivation is important, man. Oh, yes, yes. And yes. so you live in that spot. Like, you, Dion, me, a lot of people, people... Clips go viral of like. She said, "Why you keep bringing up Dion?" <laughs> because because I, I I'm a fan of Dion and that's my guy. Yes, sir. You know? <laughs> it's okay, right, Marshall? Going to Colorado. Yeah, now nah, shout out to Dion. Shout out to whoever asked that too. But what I'm what I'm saying is 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 that is that and 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 again I'm doing this because now nah, let me address that. Give me a second. The reason I continue to bring up Dion Sanders with Dr. Umar Johnson is because there's a fight amongst black boys to understand which one of these guys and why there's infighting going on between these guys. Seems like you have colorful conversations surrounding some of his moves and then half of black coaches riding with him. So my job is to try to comb through this and see if we can figure out what the issue is. You know what I'm saying? That's all it is for me. I want the information. I'm curious. Dion is somebody I know. I look at. He's motivating people. You somebody I know. You're motivating people. We talk all this black power with stuff. I'm trying to figure out why is there any kind of disagreement about his mission, your mission, because you were the same guy on a 10 year mission to build a school. Nine, so I look yeah. nine year mission to build a school. So I look at Dion like he's on a mission. So that's why I want to come through it. That's my thinking. I want to have that conversation with you. And we had it. Yes, we just stopped yes, him because sir. someone yes. brought it up. For me, my biggest concern for black men at this time is I feel like we've grown extremely selfish. I don't think black men have the type of spirit that our ancestors had. You know, you got to realize we come from a legacy where black men gave their life for the community. I mean, literally widowed their wife and left their children fatherless for the people. And I look at us now where I can't even stay at a black school and help build this up. You know, I got to run off to the white one and I'm just not seeing the spirit of sacrifice that black men used to have. It is bothering me because our women do deserve better and we can't give them what the white man gives the white woman, but we could damn sure do a better job than we are. And I think we're scapegoating racism too much because we don't want to man up. What is a complete man, in your opinion? On a basic level, yes. we got to protect and provide. I don't think we're doing either, especially when it comes to children. You got men who do it individually. Remember, we're talking as a community. See, that's Two thirds of our children are being raised by single mothers. Mm. Two thirds, no matter how you cut that cake, you can't say black men are on their job. Now, one brother might say, well, I got my kids. OK, but how many children are not your biological children that you're looking out for? Because it ain't just about your family. It's about us as a people. We have to get back to the we-ism and away from the me-ism. The me-ism is killing us. Let's talk about fundraising. Mm -hmm. what, what is the biggest donation you receive? $5,000 from a queen mother in New York City, I believe. Mm. That was the largest single donation. That's a, hell, that's a hell of a thing, man. Yeah, largest. And it was from a woman. A woman, an elder. Wow. Queen of 5,000. Did you reach out to her? Did you ever meet her? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think to, I think to, I think to uh, extensively for doing that. Most of our donors are repeat donors, right? So everybody donates. I have elders who donate $10 faithfully every month 10 10 10 10 10 mm. some of them did it for the whole nine years so you built this basically off kibbles and bits kibbles and bits kibbles and kibbles bits. bits kibbles and bits did you when was the first time you put that into your vocab not vocabulary but into your 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 whole thing what hit the cash up hit the because at first that wasn't well even when thing. i first took the first donation in st louis april of 2014 to try to get to st paul's college in virginia i didn't want to ask for the donations man because I had seen black pastors and leaders beg for money for years. And I said, I never want to be them. Right. But then I needed this school. So when I got up there, it was the most, I still feel how uncomfortable I felt that first donation. Yeah. 
And then I started getting other people to ask for the donation. So they would come and say, this is for Dr. Umar, FDMG. And then I just had to get over it and say, listen, your cause is right. You ain't stealing. You know what you're doing this for. You got to start asking. It, for but it. it feel nasty. It feel. But, yeah. But guess what? I still don't ask for the money publicly. Yeah. It's still when I'm going live. Right. Like at the lecture. And see, because it's still, it's still, yeah. it's still yeah. got a yeah. feeling yeah. Even attached though, to it. Because I'm a very honest person right. in that regard. You right. know what I mean? Right. Um, but I think I'll feel more comfortable once the school opened up. Right. Because now people see. Because remember, we money, still got yeah. the Frederick Douglass High School right across the street. We got another school right there that we got to renovate too. So how did you go through that with people saying, damn, man, I've been giving money for any, did you have anybody? Well, most of the people who were saying they've been giving money, they weren't giving money. Mm. Donors don't complain and haters don't donate. So the people you see <laughs> on YouTube with all this critic, they're not the donors. They're the haters. You see what I'm saying? And see what really happened, just to give you a little bit of backstory, there was other people in the conscious movement who were raising money for different projects and they wasn't able to raise much. So they hated on me because the people got behind my campaign. Because remember, they sabotaged my GoFundMe and everything. Oh man, they said everything. Yeah, you lost the GoFundMe. Yeah, we lost the GoFundMe. How much money would you say you lost? Well, well what happened was when uh, GoFundMe decided to cancel our campaign, first of all, they said they needed proof that I didn't spend no money. I sent them everything, even told them to call the bank, talk to the manager. Every penny was accounted for. They canceled me anyway. Mm. So it had nothing to do with whether I was still or not. Y'all just didn't want me on the platform. Right. But what happened was I'll never forget it. I looked at the fundraiser and I saw GoFundMe started refunding the donations. Nobody asked for their money back. Why are you refunding the donation? So that's when I had to hurry up and shut that down and start another account and keep on going. GoFundMe was trying to undo all them years of, wow. of raising money. Because white people don't want you. Did you lose any, like? Yeah, I'm sure. So some, some of the donations uh, was definitely refunded. But you never that. lost in whole, like, yo, 20 grand. Damn, they just snatched that. Or No, nah, I don't think it was that much. Yeah. I don't think it was. That's, that's, that was like 2016, I want to say, when that happened. Maybe 17. But I don't, I don't think it was that much. I don't what, what do you say to people who say you're too hard on the black male? Well, they say I'm too hard on everybody, not just the black male. Sisters. In specific, the black male, though. Because I'm going to be honest. Mm -hmm. Black men have came to me and said that. Like, man, he kind of be on us, man. Like, it's I'm like, this shit to. don't be I'm making supposed sense. To. Yeah, I'm but I think to. that there's a disconnect with, with, with some of the some of the understanding that you give the black woman uh -huh. in regards to the systematic stuff and it seems like the black man doesn't get that i same. think with the black some black men because most of our brothers they ride with me but some black men have trouble understanding that although i have just as much criticism for the black woman i am not going to repudiate and criticize my sister in a public space because black women are special and because they are special special we need to treat them in a special way and what these ninjas do is they'll get on youtube criticize condemn and cancel black women in the face of every other race watching you do it no other man goes public and condemns his women the way black men do and i'm not going to co-sign that because it's wrong you don't see chinese men going live talking about everything wrong with chinese women when you ever see that well, you ever see the Latino men go live and totally crucify Latino women? We do it. And you know what's dangerous about it? Who the most sexually trafficked? Black women. Who the most raped? Black women. Domestically abused? Black women. So you mean to tell me our women got it the worst? And on top of that, we're going to go public and tell the world we don't even care about them or want them no more. I got the same condemnation, but I will not do that to her in public. We got to have a stand. Now, does that, does that, okay, let's talk about this. Last week or the other week, we saw the girl with the swollen face. Yes. You came out and you said that, let me, let me frame this a little different. Last week, there was a story that came out with a black woman that had a reaction on her face. She alleged that some people beat her up for not giving her a number. You came out about that and kind of was critical about those men. That came out to be a hoax. We don't know that. Some people say it's not a hoax. I've seen several pictures and videos. I mean, I may, that may, could be wrong. Yeah. But I've seen several videos of her trying this, like several GoFundMes year after okay. year where she's okay. literally 
all these guys, and this first time it's been that crazy, look that big, but she's had smaller ones where she's, she's pulled this off yeah. before. I don't know because I put up a post that a sister sent me and said, you need to hold her accountable because she made this up. And then everybody else started commenting under this that it wasn't made up, and this is what you need to look at. So I still don't know what the truth. But let's for the sake for the sake of conversation. If you were wrong, do you think that man? I probably did. I probably should have looked a little more into that. Do you ever because nah? Because there's nothing wrong with holding black men to a standard of behavior in public when it comes to our sisters. That wasn't even there. Well, remember now. Even if it didn't happen to her. Black women are being choked out and murdered by their black male lovers on a regular basis. It's still but an this issue. this wasn't that situation. It may have not been, but yeah. my point is I'm not going to draw the energy back because when, that awareness that's coming from my commentary is still very much needed out there because black women are being abused and ignored. So at the expense of the black man, though. It's because not black, I'm, No, I'm you telling you, black men, no, black men are... Not that they're not riding with you. I don't want to be clear. Right, they're right, still right. riding with you, yeah. but they're, they're whispering... Man, I kind of didn't, I don't know what that was about. No, they what want the, me to beat the women up. I'm not going to do it. I tell them right now, I'm never going to do that. No, when you're wrong about nobody let her get beat up. And also, are know. you asking black men, I'm saying let's entertain it for the sake of okay. conversation. And also, are you asking black men to put their lives on the line for, for, would you put your life on the line for a woman you don't know and leave your children? Black woman? Yeah, black yes, woman. We don't right have now. a choice. That's part of being a man. Right now. Yes. And leave your daughters without a, without a father. Dr. King did it. Malcolm did no, it. No, I'm, I'm asking Dr. Umar. Yes, it's part of who. Okay. Nobody wants to die. I don't have a death wish. Right. But I understand as a man, my obligation is to every black woman, not just the one I'm married to and the ones I gave birth to. Okay, sounds good. I like that. <laughs> it definitely, I mean, because I'm saying, they you know, should, if a black woman some sees black, a black women to teach you as a young black male. Uh -huh. Now, here's a conundrum. Some black women to teach you as a young black kid. Don't you jump in that. They ain't okay. got nothing to do with you. Yeah. You need to make it home to little Ty Ty and little Ron Ron. And I think that's appropriate for the children. But for grown men, it's not appropriate. Mm. So he needs to rewire himself as his teaching. His teaching was you mind your business. They bother your family. Then that's one thing. But. What if we had that mentality when the Ku Klux Klan was terrorizing neighborhoods back in the Willie Lynch days? What if we said, I'm only going to worry about the Klan when they knock on my door? They would have picked us apart. We had to organize. Black people are no longer used to organizing because of our self-hate and selfishness. The only way we come out of this is by working together. That's it. And even though we talk about the celebrities, we might as well lead them out the conversation because they're not going to be a major part in what we do until after we do it. No black celebrity has ever played a major financial role in any of our movements. So I don't know why black people keep looking to them. We don't own them. White people own them. They are corporate products. LeBron, Dion, they are owned by the white power structure. They're not coming over here. They will after we win. They'll come drop some money off later, but they won't be there in the beginning. We got to do this ourselves. And we should, because we are $2 trillion people. Black people have more money than any single celebrity except maybe Oprah. We got more money than everybody else. Is that on a yearly, a annually? Annually. Yeah. We $2 trillion. Oprah not worth $2 trillion. Puffy ain't $2 trillion. Tr Jay-Z ain't worth $2 trillion. That T is a different saying? thing. We $2 yeah. trillion. Yeah. So why is the people worth $2 trillion? Two child <laughs> <laughs> why is the people worth $2 trillion? Keep trying to scapegoat billionaires. You see, and, and in their defense, you know what I say? In their defense, how are you going to expect a billionaire to sacrifice a billion when you wouldn't even sacrifice a couple hundred dollars? It's not fair. They're not, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, take my school. No celebrity has donated to FDMG, and I know plenty of celebrities. No celebrity. Not one has made a donation, and I know plenty of them. Right? Is it, that's what I mean about the brand tampering. Do you think it's because of some of the... I, I think they're fearful of my message. I think they're... I believe... They are afraid because most of them got white people in their circles. Very few of them are, have a total black team. Most of them got white folks running around. And I think they're afraid of being associated with my name. I don't see. I, I mean, I can see. But once the small school gets up and running, 
some of them might donate then because they see I was serious. Because I think some of them was also influenced by the hate. That's the what hate I'm saying. Speech. That's yeah. the brand tempering of yeah. people saying, yeah. hey, this is a scam. Yeah, hey, this yeah, might yeah, not yeah, be yeah, doing yeah. that. Da, da, da. Yeah. Now people like, I ain't knocking it, but I ain't supporting it. Right. Like, I really don't know what's right. going on. And he hard. I like how he talk. Right. I mess with him, but I'm going to stay on this side. I really right. don't know what the guy doing. Like, right, right. Dig what I'm right. saying? He right. might he talking about snow bunny never and all kind of. Well, <laughs> like, I don't know what the guy, well, then, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it, yeah. it's, it's sometimes I, I be thinking, like, you know, why won't these celebrities give? Because, again, everybody well, knows. Well, let's be honest, though. It ain't just me. They don't really give to black community anything they do united way democratic party you know uh, uh, uh because uh, they won't access the power you don't yes. got no power they want proximity to what no yeah. i got a lot of power they just don't want my kind of power the, so i got they, black power yeah they yeah, want yeah. access to white what power. happened to black power it seemed like that word evolved to like woke or conscious or like and it lost people it's like they split it up it used to be black power and right. it's just like a group of us. And now it's like you got your conscious folk. You got your D folk. You, you know why? Because a lot of black people in the conscious movement don't want to be considered black or African. So woke and all of that did evolve. You're correct. Because I don't want to be associated with blackness or Africanness. And black power. It was a self-hate thing. It's the same way pan-Africanism became black nationalism. Why did pan-African... I love you too, mama. Be blessed now. Oh, tomorrow, just so y'all know, I'm speaking at uh, Tennessee State New Residence Hall Conference Room, 10 a.m. to 12, if any of y'all want to come. It's going to be a Q&A session. She and loves you, Dr. Tomorrow, Umar. It's free, so just pull up. Bring bunnies, bring whatever you want to bring. Um, <laughs> bring no bunnies. bunnies. I'm just playing with you. But um, black nationalism was a knockoff from Pan-Africanism. Because after Garvey got deported, most of the black national leaders who came after them wasn't interested in building a relationship with Africa. So that's how the pan-African nationalism became the black na We've always had a problem wanting to be black. That's why you got black people running around now and say they're not from Africa at all. I'm Native American. I've been here since the beginning. Well, that's absolutely ridiculous because every scientific uh, uh, study has proven unequivocally, indisputably, that all humanity originated in Africa. Mm. So there's no such thing as you didn't come from Africa because everybody did. Mm. You see? But the self-hate is so that you got Negroes say, I'm a Cherokee, I'm a Choctaw, I'm a this or that. Don't get me wrong. We have some of those bloods in us because we mixed with them. But having a little bit of Cherokee in you don't stop you from being an African. You don't find a white person with a, with a great, great grandparent from Africa and now they no longer a Jew. They still a Jew. They just got a black grandfather somewhere. But when a Negro finds out he got some Caucasian blood, he stops being black completely. <laughs> He's a total Italian. <laughs> they won't even let his ass in the church. Well, uh, so this, and this will be probably our last, last sequence. Um, I want to talk about Trump, and specifically the charges that he's facing. Um, what, what, what's your feelings on the, all of the various uh indictments that Donald i got Trump a couple a couple couple number one a lot of this is being done by the democratic party because they don't want trump available to run because there's a strong chance he wins and now that they've turned him into a political martyr Mistake. they have just made his electoral base that much stronger they just gave him votes by right. doing that so why don't the why don't the old power structure understand that that has an adverse reaction to like arrest this guy when he's been Teflon to these like all of these little attempts to like right. smear him. They don't work for him. Well, the problem that most traditional politicians have with Trump, even within the Republican Party, he's not a traditional politician. He's a businessman. Right. They hate the fact that a businessman came over into the presidential race and won it his first time. Right. See that. Now, here's the problem that the power structure has with Donald Trump. Because you know they select presidents before you vote for them. Mm. The problem with Donald Trump as president is he thinks he's actually in charge. <laughs> he don't understand. You are an employee. We tell you what to do. Donald Trump doesn't have a political background, so he don't know the president. Scribbling is just outside a the flunky, lines. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Obama knew. I'm just a flunky. Biden knew. Because they are career politicians. Trump think if I'm CEO, I'm CEO. 
No, Ninja. It just looks like you CEO. Remember, he didn't support the COVID. He didn't support the immigration. Went against he CIA. He went against the LGBTQ. Yeah. They're like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're going against our major initiatives. So if they decide to let him win again, they're going to have a conversation with him. Because they're going to tell him, listen, yeah. you can't go against this, yeah. this or this, or we'll have to kill you. Because he exposed a lot. <laughs> he, he exposed a lot. No, that's what they do. They kill folks. And they don't want to have to kill him because he's too popular. You feel me? Right. And it's going to be clear as day that y'all Yeah, done. yeah. So yeah. they're going to they gonna have to sit him down and tell him, listen, man, your second term can't be like your first term. We need you to chill a little bit. Stay off the COVID stuff. Stay <laughs> off the gay stuff. Stay, you feel me? The rest of the cowboy shit you do, you straight. Right. But stay off of these things. Right. But uh, the Democrats are going to try to keep him tied up so he can't run. Now, with that indictment, what if I, he runs, he wins. Yeah, he wins. Yeah. But I'm looking at that indictment, number one, for what Trump, I feel like it's a, a, a global circus, right? We're arresting the president. It's just all kind of stuff going yeah. on. But I'm more examining the fact that Fonnie Willis out, out of Atlanta, which is the prosecutor, mm -hmm. she's the same person that indicted Young Thug, mm -hmm. YFN, Lucci, a lot of different people down there. Um, in regards to RICO charges. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is, is that Fani is using this RICO charge in an unprecedented way, right? There's no case law on it. And so she's casting a very wide net. I'm wondering if her charging Trump exposes the, the, the young thug and the, the wife in Lucci overreaching. Right. Because I think you put billionaires in your business and they comb get a little thicker. It's like it's a fine tooth comb. They looking at stuff with. And, and okay. I'm wondering, is there an opportunity for them to say, yo, you're reaching like you did with Trump. You did the same thing with. The, and they kind of lumped that in like, yo, you reaching with all these guys. You're just a reacher. I think it's all political theater at the end of the day. I'd be surprised if he do any real time. Now, I do want to say this, because you got some black people say, you look at Joe Biden and what he didn't do. Trump and Biden are equal, or maybe Trump was a little better. I reject that, because I look at the fact that Donald Trump signed more death execution warrants than any president in American history since slavery. And explain what those is for the viewers. Uh, when that people don't. are on death row, the president can either stall it. Uh, execute it execute them or what to pardon them. Trump signed like two or three of them his last days in office. So you're about to leave. You're not even a president no more. And you still found time to kill a few more people. And one or two of them was black. You know, so I look at that. You know, I look at the disrespect he showed for slavery, what we've been through. Anytime he had a chance to show that he didn't care about black folks, he showed it. So I can't vote for nothing like that. And for me, I don't think we should be voting for either one. What we should be doing is organizing our votes. We should have a black political union. And then we negotiate with the nominee of each party. In other words, Trump, you're the nominee for the Republicans. Biden, you're the nominee for the Democrats. Well, guess what? I represent the black political union of America. We're not a party. We're just a conglomerate of black votes, and we are pledging to vote in the same direction. There's 50 million blacks in America. I got 20 million black votes. What are you going to give me? What are you going to give me? And guess what? Whatever they promise you, they have to deliver. You know why? Because if you got 20 million votes, you dictate who wins every time. Because presidential elections are often decided by less than 3 million. You got 20 million. They're going to do whatever you tell them to do. The problem with black people, we never organize our vote along a black community platform. We've always served the Democratic plantation, the Republic plantation. We know we're going to get tired of that and say it's time for us to pull our votes out of both and vote as a people. That's what we need to do. But you know what? Nobody wants us to vote as a people, Brother Todd. You know why? Black politicians do not want black people with an organized vote. Why don't your black elected officials in Tennessee want you organized? Because now you can hold them accountable. So now you're going to make them fight the white people they've been having tea and biscuits with. Now he got to go and fight the snow bunny he's been sleeping with to bring back resources to Nashville. Nobody wants black people organized. Not white politicians, not black politicians, because an organized black community is a powerfully dangerous black community. All we got to do is organize, y'all. 
But we got to stop being lazy, complacent, and we got to stop thinking we could do everything on social media. That's another issue. One thing I respect about the Jehovah Witnesses, do mm. you see them on YouTube recruiting? They do you see the Jehovah Witnesses on TikTok recruiting? Uh-uh. They still knock on your door. The Jehovah Witnesses have not changed their street, street, street strategy. I got a speech and language impairment. <laughs> street strategy yet, they still knocking on doors. Why we don't knock on doors no more? We want to do everything with Twitter fingers. They can't do that. You got to get in black people's face and make them feel you and let them know that you're sincere and then they'll come out for you. We got to go back to old fashioned street organizing and we got to organize that black dollar. I don't care how much we march. I don't care how much we protest until we organize the black dollar. We'll never have black power. The dollar equals power. You got to organize. Last thing. You are one of the best speakers. It's probably my third or fourth time saying that because, again, I study this. So I, I know what it takes to do it. And, and um, you're one of those guys. Who would you put you, you I've heard you say before you you feel like you're the greatest black speaker period of this day of not this history. day yeah of this day not history yes Dr. Umar Johnson versus Farrakhan that would not be fair because in all due respect to the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan he's in his 90th decade to put him against me at this time it wouldn't be fair but he is a but oh, he's, he's still, still living. No, he's still a great speaker. Don't get me are wrong. Are you saying that because you, you, you feel like your youth outwits him? Or are you saying that because his, his, his uh, experience, it just isn't fair because he's been doing it much more longer than you've been doing it? For me, I would personally consider it arrogant to compare myself to an elder. Period? Uh, period. Of, of, so how can you, so yes. how can you make the, the, the statement that I am the... Greatest speaker of this day. That's that's well, a he, comparison indirectly, right? Well, you could say that, but I would not include elders in that conversation. For me, they are a protected class, so they're not even they're not even considered in that conversation, right? Like Jesse Jackson, in his youth, he was one hell of a public speaker. You right, Minister Sharpton, a great speaker. Okay. Uh, Minister Farrakhan, a great speaker, but they're elders now, so I wouldn't want to compare myself directly to an elder. Now, if you say in Sound like youth, you running from the smoke. I'm going to be honest. No, no, but they're elders, right? Sound like you, but, and but, you a bad man, no, but boy. Listen, I ain't listen, never listen, heard you by the eye like that, Put them in their prom. Put them in their prom. Yeah. Right? And I've, I've had the opportunity to see them all speak in their prom. Now you have a conversation. Mm. Who would win? I don't know. I know I would hold my weight with any of yeah, them. Yeah, of course. Of you course. know what I mean? Now, I putting them message, against each other, what about that? Like Jesse versus Farrakhan. That's prime. Tough, because in his prime, Jesse was a bad man. I never. Mind. I need to go watch Jesse. I didn't know Jesse was yeah. hard. A bad yeah. man like that. Even at the Million Man March, I thought his energy, maybe not necessarily his message. The message was that, but the energy behind it, mm. it was a very. He was one of the ones I remember the most, and I was out there. Mm. You know what I mean? So Jesse, Jesse was bad. But remember, he was, he studied King. Right. Farrakhan he was, was under <laughs> Malcolm. You know King I mean? was so hard too. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? so. But if you if you go on historically all time, yeah, I don't think nobody's beaten Garvey, Douglas, and King. Do they have any videos on YouTube? Uh, there's where, a few. Where did you where are you hearing this stuff at? Uh, well, with, with Garvey, there's some audio of Garvey. King, obviously. Yes. Uh, and, and and Douglas, you can't get his audio, but you can get renditions of his voice done by people who heard him speak. Mm, okay, okay. You know, and that's okay. how, you know, he had the baritone and the slow, strong right, delivery and right. that kind of thing. Yeah, I think Garvey and Douglas were the two greatest of all time, not just because they're my two, you know, favorite ancestors. And then I think Dr. King is right there behind him. Right. Dr. King's style was so different from anybody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? He had Dr. that cadence, King. too. Yeah, yeah, he was born to do what he did. Yeah, he had that cadence. All three of them. Well, you could tell the ones who were selected by the universe. You yeah, can just tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just part Dr. of... King was born to do. That's why Dr. King finished high school early, finished college early. Why was Dr. King life moving so right. fast? Because he had so much to do in a little bit of time yeah. to do it. Wow. And that's why in African tradition, we always talk about knowing your purpose. All of us negotiate a purpose in heaven with God before we incarnate. Mm. And this life is about you finding what is your purpose. What is your purpose for being? Everybody in this auditorium, you got a reason why you exist. And it is a divine reason. And you're supposed to spend your life finding and fulfilling your mission. And this is why if you find yourself not being happy, even though everything you have around you says you should be happy, you're probably not fulfilling your mission. 
right? You might be a multi-billion dollar businessman, but you was not sent to this world to make money. You might have been sent to this world to make other people feel better about themselves. So this is where a lot of us end up being unhappy and feeling like, what's wrong with my life? I got money. I got, you know, beautiful wife. I got a nice car, nice house, job I don't want, but I'm not happy because you're not fulfilling your mission. God don't care about the checkbook. God don't care about the bank account. Why were you sent here? If you made it through your mother's womb, if you came out of that vagina, you have a reason for being here because not everybody makes it out. All right. It's up there podcast. Y'all take that game and do something with it. I thank every one of y'all from the center of my soul for being out here tonight. Great conversation. Dr. Umar Johnson. Definitely going up on YouTube. And uh, just to let y'all know, tomorrow at a new residence hall conference room, I'll be speaking from 10 to 12 in the morning. It's early because, you know, the game is in the afternoon and I will be going to the game. I haven't had a chance to go to a lot of HBCU football games. So uh, this is one and I'd rather be here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, <laughs> and let me give you my phone number in case any of y'all ever need to reach me, especially parents about your children, if you got issues and things like that. And if you work with, you know, uh, distressed populations, if you ever need me to come and talk or do a seminar or workshop, let me know. I'm a distressed population. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> Children, and you don't have a copy of that book, you might need it because there's a lot of information in there, a lot of sample letters you can use to protect your child from the special ed assault and the ADHD con game. No drugs and no IEPs. IEPs don't help nobody and drugs don't do nothing but destroy the mind. Stay off it. And for my parents that are autistic children, stop getting those autistic children evaluated at two and three. They're too young. You can't prove autism at two. They might have some of the features, but you can't be sure until they're at least five or six. The reason the school wants you to test them at two and three is they want that money. It's all about the money. They want to start the money. You tell them, uh-uh, I'm just going to watch my baby, let him grow. Next year, I'll check in with you. If I, start, if I feel like he's autistic, I'll let y'all know. But we're not testing him because y'all feel it. We got to test it because I feel. Make sure you understand you are in the, and you, you're in the driver's seat. If you don't sign, they can't do nothing. Even if your child is in special ed, I keep telling y'all that. If you don't sign permission, nothing can happen. You are always in charge. Also, it's up there podcast. Everybody go subscribe. This interview has some behind the scenes stuff will be coming out our next event. If it'll be here or somewhere else, but we're working through that. It's already locked in. So anyone that RSVP to this, watch out for your email. You'll get an email, maybe a location change, it may not be. But if you're here tonight and you wanna be at the next one, I salute you.